Okay, so please like mark what Justice Bajaj said because you don't have to include this kind of thing for us. Is it possible that, even uh, even if we create folders that the registry Dr. is? Dr. Swami, it appears that you have included the entirety of the Keshwan and the judgment. I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize that, my lord. I think, I think Dr. Swami, uh, let's not make assumptions about ignorance because your entire volume, a major um, part of it is on the issue that the courts in India have the power of judicial review. So I think uh, this could have been stated more clearly. And one sentence with a couple of footnotes. And well, I apologize, my lord. I didn't. I didn't know that th these cases were uploaded. I'm. I'm very sorry. Also, what happens? Apologize you know, the with, with so much of data, it also burdens the system which we are all operating. You see, because... uh, Dr. Guruswami, your substituted written submissions run into 159 pages. One has to go over all the same things again and again. No, no, my lord, sir, it's, it's mostly annexures which are domestic studies. There's no repetition, my lords. Very well, but you see this this page. What we would suggest is that you know cut down your written submissions to the core because otherwise. What I would better. suggest is, my lord, what uh, not for on on our side, my lord, that instead of uh, lord, uh, annexing judgments. If we rely upon one para, we can quote in our written submissions. So that in, in one go, your lordship can read it. It might increase from 50 to 90, but it would easily. You know, yes, my lord. Purpose of, having, purpose of having a common compilation is that all the judgments which were going to be cited are included in that common compilation. But surely something like Keshwan Bharti, you don't have to include in the common Yes, I, I apologize, my lord. Because you'll be relying upon one true, para, which we can always I'm look so at sorry. from the, we can look at that paragraph from our uh, law report. Yes, and, and in any case, the relevant Lord, extracts are there. Point, so I'm not sorry. sure why let's just... Lord, 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 some courts want the whole judgment to be included. Well, what we do in Madras, at least put the title page and that relevant paragraph yes. and also permission to highlight the passage uh, also mr datar if uh, the judgment is 30 40 50 pages it doesn't matter because then it really doesn't burden the uh, because no. sometimes you want to read around you would really want to read that volumes my lord no, what but something like that please put to swami my lord it's in lord. My Lord, may I just cut this just, short because we are so time bound that right, we, get, anyway, we'll be we'll burdened with your Lordship. Only one but, word, my Lord, if your Lordship is not true. Yes, one, one of the people has to be said on this side. Uh, on ours. But I'm appearing on this side. One word, my Lord. Yes. Protocol for allocation of time, all this has to be set down now. That's very important. Lord, this is a very good beginning. But let it be done properly. All right. We'll make some suggestions. All right. But let's not waste. Uh, it. Going by now. This, my lord, I think uh, we may start tomorrow. Lord. That's. They will take the whole of the day, I think. They, therefore, we we'll sort of kept it till four or five just to make sure you start tomorrow. <laughs> yes, Ms. Rutha. Uh, so, my lord, just. Uh... Why don't you formulate and tell us basically what are the three or four points that you will be covering? So that I think then we'll have a good picture of. How much we have to uh so Mlad, i've given a short written three-page note on my submissions what yesterday another, another note. along with the south african judgment so basically what i'm going to my lord address your lordship is with regard to the foreign marriage act which has only been referred to by dr singhvi in with regard to notice but it's an important secular act, so I want to refer to that. Sluka, so I want to I first refer to the 23rd Law Commission. Clarify, your written submissions remain the same. That was part of compilation one? Yes. At yes. Page 556 PD. That's right. The three page written right. submissions, basically. Yes. Milod, the detailed submissions are on page 556, and the three page submission was given separately along with one judgment of the Constitutional Court of South Africa yesterday. What is it's called a written note. So it's just a three page note yes. saying what are the basic points that I will cover. Okay. Has my Lord Justice Kohli got that? Ah, uh, yes, yes. My Lord, it will be in the same folder <laughs> as the written submissions. Yes. So what are you going to argue, Ms. Uh, so, so, my lord, the 23rd Law Commission report I'll refer to briefly, which was the precursor of the Foreign Marriage Act. Then the Foreign Marriage Act and the fact that it applies to one Indian citizen living abroad uh, who will marry a foreign 
citizen and their rights which come under the Foreign Marriage Act. Then, my Lord, after that, I want to refer to the Committee of Nations because that is uh, what Section 17.3 of the Foreign Marriage Act talks about. Then, my Lord, I will want to refer to three judgments. Uh, my Lord, all the Indian judgments have been referred to by Mr. Rodki in detail. And uh, the foreign judgments, Oberfell, has already been referred to in detail in Nalsa, in Putuswami, in um, Navtej. Lord, I want to refer to two of those, the Yoga Karta principles, and then, my Lord, the read-in and the judicial interpretation and how the Special Marriage Act and Foreign Marriage Act, both are actually the Foreign Marriage Act is really an extension of the Special Marriage Act. So, my Lord, that's briefly what I am... Right, why don't we follow your note now, that note which you gave this morning. Yes. Then we can pause and you can sort of explain. It's a very short three-page okay. note, so we can really explain that. That's the best. So, let's start with the background. <clears throat> Yes, my lord. Uh, so, what is distinct about the petitioner number one and two herein is that they are the only persons who are legally and validly married in another country, that is the United States of America. They were married in Texas under the valid civil law, and they have a four-month-old daughter so, my Lord, they had a relationship and a commitment to each other from 2012. They finally got married in 2017. So, they've had a six-year marriage. And, my Lord, it is grossly unjust that they are free and equal in other parts of the world, in the free democracies. But in India, the country of the birth of petitioner number one, they do. They are invisible, and their rights are not recognized. Milad, concomitant with that, I want to bring out the fact that during COVID time, visas were granted to spouses of Indian citizens, but not being recognized, this person did not get petitioner two did not get a visa. So while they are a family, while they are married couple in the US, they could not come to India during COVID times, otherwise they would have been eligible. So insofar as their marriage is concerned, it is neither recognized nor visible in India. What they had sought to do was get their marriage registered under the Foreign Marriage Act, and marriages can be solemnized and registered under the Foreign Marriage Act. May I take immediately the court to the 23rd Law Commission report, which is on PDF file. Uh, you have filed it. We need not read it. You can just go through your submission on that. So, my lord, the 23rd Law Commission report was a takeoff from the Special Marriage Act, which provided under 4E that persons, two persons who were citizens of India living abroad, because my citizenship goes along with me wherever I may travel. They so were in the special, special Marriage Act applies when both parties are Indian citizens. Would apply, used They're, to apply. Yes. But then that clause was deleted and the Foreign Marriage Act came in its place saying even when one is a citizen, they uh, dilated on the fact where the domicile should be included, other requirements should be included, came finally to this, that at least one party is an Indian citizen, they'll be able to get matrimonial relief, and they, it's an enabling provision, you can have a mode of marriage, under the Foreign Marriage Act, secular act like the Special Marriage Act, and that's why we have to, we want that it has to be interpreted in a manner which would... So the Foreign Marriage Act now stipulates that where at least one of the parties is an Indian citizen. That's right. That is the only criteria, and I will read with some details 17.3 of the Foreign Marriage Act. Let's see the Foreign Marriage Act. So, if you're... Brothers, uh, Brother uh, Paul and Brother uh, Bhatt, you have the Foreign Marriage Act with you readily available? It's available with us, Chief. Yeah. Let's see the provisions. This is the relevant provision. 
So, my Lord, can I just take your Lordship for a minute to the statement of objects and reasons? Sure. Uh, now, it basically says the following are the salient features of the bill. One, it provides for an enabling form of marriage, more or less on the same lines as the Special Marriage Act. Two, it seeks to lay down certain rules in respect of capacity of parties, conditions of validity of marriage, and also provides for registration. Three, the provisions of the Special Marriage Act in regard to matrimonial reliefs are sought to be made applicable with suitable modification, not only to marriages solemnized or registered under the proposed legislation, but also to other marriages solemnized abroad to which a citizen of India is a party. Now, my Lord, if I may take your my Lords to section four. Yes. A marriage between parties, one of whom at least is a citizen of India, may be solemnized under this act by or before a marriage in a foreign country if at the time of the marriage the following conditions are fulfilled, namely, and it says the conditions which are there under the Special Marriage Act. Well, Lord, the interpretation of 4C would have to be read in. Now, Dr. Singhvi has already spoken about Section 5, which is notice of intended marriage. And now, my Lord, if I may take my Lord's two, and solemnize of marriage where no objection is made, nine. Now, 11, my Lord. Marriage not to be in contravention of local laws. The marriage officer may, for reason to be recorded in writing, refuse to solemnize a marriage under this act if the intended marriage is prohibited by any law in force in the foreign country where it is to be solemnized. Now, clearly, we are the only couple, as I said, who are the petitioners before this court who are validly married according to local laws and what a travesty it is of fairness, my Lord, where we in a country where which believes in the rule of law, which has a very robust system of fundamental rights, where this is the country of my citizenship and I'm being denied these rights. My Lord, 17, my Lord. Registration of foreign marriages. And these can be, so they can be solemnization under the Act and they can be registration under the Act. 17 is talking about registration under the Act paramateria to the Special Marriage Act. A, a marriage officer is satisfied that a marriage has been duly solemnized in a foreign country in accordance with the law of of that country between parties of whom one at least was a citizen of India. Which a party to the marriage uh, informs the marriage officer in writing that he or she desires the marriage to be registered under this section. Now, my Lord, we went to Washington to the marriage officer and we got no answer. Then we wrote an email and we were told, since you are a same-sex couple, therefore we are not registering your marriage. That's in my writ petition, which is 501.15. I'm not going to refer to read it out. Then, my Lord, 2, 17.2. No marriage shall be registered under this section unless at the time of registration it satisfies the conditions mentioned in 4. Now, my Lord, comes the relevant part, the only ground on which they can refuse. The only ground on which they can refuse is the marriage officer may, for reasons to be recorded in writing, refuse to register marriage under this section on the ground that, in his opinion, the marriage is inconsistent with international law or the Committee of Nations. Today, 34 countries have 
accepted same-sex marriage, the country in which local law I have been married recognizes my marriage and therefore the marriage is in accordance with international law. With regard to the Committee of Nations, my Lord, my case is that it accords with the Committee of Nations and India has always recognized whether through Vishaka, whether th through Alcon, whether through a host of judgments that Committee of Nations principle will be respected by the India. There are there are no conditions for marriage set out in this. Section four, my lord. What are those Sec conditions? Section four. Neither party has a spouse living. Neither party is an idiot or a lunatic. The bridegroom has completed the age of twenty-one years, and the bride the age of eighteen years at the time of marriage. But because it says under section eleven that it marriage not to be in contravention of local laws and my marriage was valid under the local laws in texas in the usa the marriage is not in contravention so and it is in compliance also of section four so there are only two conditions one that it should be in accordance with the international but law it, it, second it, it should be in it mentions about prohibited degrees. Where is the prohibited yes. degree? Yes, my lord. Where is it? Four, four, four yes. proviso. Yeah. Four, 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 four D and four proviso. Where do we get what is prohibited degree of relationship? Two A, my lord. <clears throat> Same as Degrees of prohibited two A, my lord. Degrees of prohibited relationship. So basically, the PA has been imported. Yes, and the proviso makes an exception of 4D, similar to SMA, my lord. Now, just 27 and then... The proviso and to section 4, which says that if personal law or custom governing at least one of the parties permits of a marriage between them. That's so the personal law comes in here, right? That's if the personal law permits, and this is not special marriage. If the personal law, if one is a, let's say, of belonging to X religion, it personal law permits or does not permit, if the, if, if the personal law of the other person permits it, then the marriage is possible. No, uh, and no. notwithstanding that they are in a prohibited degree of relationship. So, are, so that is an exception that is, that to personal law. So uh. that, that, uh, Chief Justice, that, say, that is also subject to custom, isn't it? For right, instance, right. So what it says is where the personal law or custom yes. governs, uh, permits the marriage between the parties, then even if they were otherwise within a prohibited degree of relationship under the Special Marriage Act, that marriage would be valid. That marriage can be uh, registered. That is up to a custom. Then we bring in custom there. Right. Personal law or custom, both. My Lord, Section 27. So the matrimonial reliefs, if I may just point out section 18, which I won't read, are in accordance with the Special Marriage Act. And my lord, all matrimonial judgments, because they deal with the status of parties, and therefore there is great importance, are judgments in REM under the Evidence Act. So great importance to my status. No one can just brush it under the carpet and say, that look, how does it matter? You can have a live-in relationship. The live-in relationship does not answer my status. And my status as a person who is married, who has rights under marriage, has to be recognized if I have to get true equality. Malod section 27. Act not to affect validity of marriages outside it, Nothing in this act shall in any way affect the validity of a marriage solemnized in a foreign country otherwise than under this act. And my Lord, 17 does a deeming provision under 17.6 that you are deemed to be married under this act. I 
failed to point that out. 17.6, a marriage registered under this section shall from the date of registration be deemed to have been solemnized under this act. So, my Lord, as far as the Foreign Marriage Act is concerned and the scheme, my Lord, that is what I wanted to refer to. Now, my Lord, if your Lordship may come to the next point that I wanted to speak about, which were the rights of citizens under the Foreign Marriage Act. So, as I said, my Lord, the Foreign Marriage Act envisages marriages solemnized abroad would be recognized as long as they are within local laws of the country. They would be registered if they are in accordance with the international law and they are in accordance with the committee of nations my rights as a citizen cannot be denied to me just because i'm living abroad look at the anomaly it creates i am a married couple abroad i have a family abroad i come to india and then we become strangers in this country just because we have not interpreted or given full effect to our constitutional and fundamental rights under part three. So if same sex and gender non-conforming couple marriages are excluded, my marriage becomes invisible. I, as an Indian citizen, will have my rights trampled upon. I come here, my spouse, petitioner number two's in-laws are in model town in Delhi. It's so near home and yet they cannot travel they cannot be recognized they become non-family non-citizens this cannot be my lord they cannot be known married just because they are entering the soils of this country which upholds fundamental rights all right let's go to item four of your submission you made the yes so my lord item four is what uh my lord Four is what I've just referred to, the discrimination on the ground of sex, sexual orientation, gender of my partner is violative of my inherent human rights. So, my Lord, for this special reference would have to be to Article 50, discrimination on the ground of sex. So, discrimination happens on the ground of my sex, my partner's sex, my sexual orientation, my partner's sexual orientation. My Lord, even if we don't emphasize on my freedom of expression, we don't have of my right to life, my right under of equality and marriage equality, the most fundamental is that it is discrimination on the ground of sex. Same way as in many parts of the world, women were not given right to vote only on the ground of sex. There is no distinction. There is no distinction. Sex and gender, sexual orientation, and your lordships have held that. My lord, may I just come to number five, point number five, my lord. My short. <clears throat> my lord, the concept of marriage and family. My lord, I uh, want to re-emphasize, which I'm sure is there, that marriage is the oldest social institution. So while man is an individual, he has autonomy, he also is a social being. COVID times have shown that demonstrably how difficult we found to be living alone and in an island. So being a social person, this is the oldest social institution and marriage is an expansive, evolutionary inclusive concept. At one time, interracial marriages were not recognized in the US. In India, intercaste marriages were not recognized. So on, we've, marriage has never been a static concept. It's a evolving concept. Mm -hmm. The moment that we have recognized that those of the LGBT plus community have rights. We have, they may be a minority, but the majority cannot decide the rights of a minority. And my Lord, when I say this, I just want to quote John Stuart Mill, which I did in the beginning of my note, if I may just show, uh, say that, uh, resound that with the quote, if all mankind minus one were of one opinion, 
and only one person over of the contrary opinion, mankind would be no more justified <laughs> in silencing that one person than he, if he had the power, would he be justified in sil silencing mankind. The tendency of society is normally to impose by other means than civil penalties, its own ideas, practices as a rule of conduct, on those who dissent from them to fetter the development and if possible, prevent the formation of any individuality, not in harmony with its ways and compel all characters to fashion themselves upon the model of its own. May I now turn back to the note, my Lord, numbers at point six. six. So my Lord, this is dealing with the Committee of Nations when I read out section 17.3, I referred to this. May I just refer to Black's Law Dictionary, my lord? Committee, committee in the legal sense is neither a matter of absolute obligation on the one hand, nor of mere courtesy and goodwill upon the other. But it is the recognition which one nation allows within its territory to the legislative, executive, or judicial acts of another nation, having due regard both to international duty and convenience, and the rights of its own citizens or of persons who are under the protection of its laws. My Lord, the Yoga Karta, Yogya Karta principles have already been referred to. May I refer to, sorry. So, Malad, the Yogya Karta principles have been referred to in Navdeet Singh Johar as well in his Nalsa. I'm only going to read para 563 of Johar, which is in my written submissions. I'll just read it out. However, the overwhelming weight of international opinion and the dramatic increase in the pace of recognition of fundamental rights for same-sex couples reflects a growing consensus towards sexual orientation equality. We feel inclined to concur with the accumulated wisdom reflected in these judgments not to determine the meaning of the guarantees contained within the Indian constitution, but to provi provide a sound and appreciable confirmation of our conclusion about these guarantees. My Lord, may I jump start to the judgments, which are my point number seven, because this is the point. So, my Lord, what I am saying is constitutional committee, the fundamental mm -hmm. rights require not just committee of nations, the word is constitutional committee. And at the risk of framing this, there has to be a constitutional committee. India cannot be lagging behind.
Uh, now we'll go to your point number seven. Yes, my lord. So, my lord, basically what I'm saying is 12 out of the G20 countries, including the European Union, have permitted same-sex and marriages and about 34 countries okay. of the world. But virtually every democratic, progressive country of the world has recognized same-sex marriages. We cannot be behind, even if it's one person, even if it's one minority, we cannot deny them their rights. And my Lord, these rights... Yes. My Lord, these rights include their rights of visas, of passports, of right to live in India, because they can't be made to shunt in and out as tourists. Uh, rights of inheritance. Sorry. Lord, yes. my, sorry, my lord, my rights of adoption, my rights to have children, whatever means permissible under law, my rights to for insurance, my rights, every right flows actually out of this old institution, which is recognized and has been revered in our country. So we can't just uh, wipe it clean by saying that it means nothing. Now, my lord, uh, uh, your lordships may just uh, look at three, four judgments which I want to refer to, which are court-led recognition of same-sex marriages. Because the issue that is, was being raised was, should it be by the court, should it be by parliament? The constitutional duty is of these courts to uphold part three of our constitution. And therefore, that interpretation has to be placed, which will, uh, which will bring this in. My Lord, Oberfell and Fori have been read in part, and they are in the compilation. I may just take your Lordship to the Austrian judgment, which is the Constitutional Court of Austria. It's page 1080 of the PDF file, volume 4 of the PDF file. First year, what little time is <clears throat> So my Lord, if I may take your Lordship to 1080. This was a case, my Lord, in Austria. They have two parallel legislations, one permitting marriages. Uh, which volume would this be? Volume four, Volume four Lord. Four in judgment. Yes. Four in? In the judgment. In the judgment compilation. Yes, we got it. One zero eight zero. Does Justice Call have it? Um, Lord, just a minute. Four. What are you reading, the part of the judgment or the articles? My Lord, just the judgments, Austrian, and then one South African judgment of 1999. Okay, you read it, I'm listening. They'll take it out in the meantime. Yes. My Lord, uh, just the prefix to the judgment, the facts, uh, according to the applicable law, legislators had separated marriage between heterosexual couples and registered partnerships between same-sex couples and had provided for different institutions for their relationships to be recognized by the state. So they were two exactly similar with all the same rights, except that they were two parallel institutions. One is a same-sex partnership, and the other is a marriage. Now, my lord, if I may take my lord to PDF page. I think it's 1090, but it's 2.4. Lord, having given the background, 
2.4.1090. This distinction between two legal institutions can no longer be upheld today without discriminating against same-sex couples with regard to their sexual orientation due to the fact that according to applicable law, legislators have separated marriage and registered partnerships as a consequence opposite sex and same-sex couples by providing for different institutions for their relationships to be recognized by the state and even if the provisions governing these institutions have essentially the same legal consequences it can be seen in a wide range of relationship arrangements okay. that although registered partnership and marriages are comparable in terms of legal relations and legal consequences, those institutions still cover relationships that are basically unequal. Then 2.5. So, Ms. Luthra, yes, there, was, there was a separate body of law Indeed. which permitted these civil relationships to be, you know, registered. So yes, first, there was a there was a body of law like in England. In England also there were civil partnerships from 2004. Now this is that kind of a situation where there is an existing pre-existing statutory platform. Now what is not very clear is when was this law enacted? Was it in 2009 or even earlier? Because it does refer to personal law, section 8, etc. Yes, my lord. And I, I believe it was much earlier. I'll just answer uh, your logic. No, no, no. Then. Please turn to page two, uh, para two. At, lord, oh. at para two, at page 1087 of the PDF. Para 2.1 actually says that same sex couples can enter into a registered partnership pursuant to the Registered Partnership Act. Partnership. That's right. I, I just want to draw the attention of the court to the excerpt of the Federal Act on the Registered Partnership Federal Law Gazette 2009. So this law was enacted apparently in 2000 and later amended in 2015. That is para 2. Point one, yeah. That's right. That's right. Lord. Now, please, Lord. now please proceed. Grateful, my Lord. My Lord, 2.6, I'm skipping 2.5 because of paucity of time and so, my Lord, 2.6, the distinction in the law between opposite sex and same sex relationship as two different legal institutions thus violates the principle of equality, which forbids any discrimination of individual on the ground of personal characteristics such as their sexual orientation. So, even the requirement to disclose that you will come under partnerships, even though you get the same gamut of rights, was itself considered to be discriminatory. My Lord, going on on 3.2. But uh, fact, so, Ms. Yeah. Uh, Lutra, yes. even on issues such as adoption and medically assisted procreation, there are specific legislations in uh, Austria. So, uh, you know, if you look at the bottom of page 1081, they say that recent developments in law allowed in particular joint parenthood also of same-sex couples. See in particular sections 191 and 197 of the General Civil Code and use permitted forms of medically assisted procreation on an equal footing. Namely, Reproductive, Reproductive Medicine uh, Act, Federal Law Gazette, 1992 as amended. Yes, in the next program. This is like two systems of law. See, this is a, let us understand the background. This is a civil law country where, um, I mean, keeping aside the considerations of personal law, personal uh, law emanating from different, different parties' religions, we don't know how much of a, a plurality exists in that society. Keeping aside that, this is more of an issue of classification where they say that you cannot really treat them as separate classes. Now we are at a more, more fundamental stage. We have not legislated. So you want us to get into the second phase and say there is no classification. Yes, there is actually no classification as of now. 
And basically, what I'm asking is that even that was invidious of the equality interpretation. The fact that they had all the bundle of rights, whereas I have no right. I have no right. I want recognition of my marriage as an incident of 14, 15, 19, and 21. So the fact is, yes, we may be jump starting, but we are too late in the day. We have to come to that stage. We are already too late. We can't, India can't be lagging behind so much. Our jurisprudence has is being seen all over the world, but here we are lagging behind the others. And we cannot deny our minorities, my lord. So your lordship is right that they were already two parallel institutions. But see how far they go that even parallel institutions can't go. So in this case, what I'm saying is, I'm only asking there should be one institution. That's marriage. And I want that right. Our citizens' rights are no land. What can you tell to and my lord, what the court finally interpreted was, we are leaving both and let either side enter into either so that even same-sex people can get into marriage, even uh, heterosexuals can get into registered. Pa pa registered partnership. That's what the conclusion of the court was, which is so beautiful. Just see paragraph 2.6, that's what you are really arguing. That's right, my lord. That's right. That's right. She's already arguing. Is there any right we have? That's the second point. <laughs> is, is this a right? Navtej <laughs> guaranteed this to us. And my lord, Navtej had actually started the footprints, and we have to now give effect to it. We cannot be left halfway. We cannot be re left with our rights being so in In cohesion. Austria, it appears that there were two different legal institutions created by law. Uh, marriage for opposite sex heterosexual couples and a registered same partnership for same sex couples. So they said that this restriction, uh, namely a registered partnership for same sex couples, this is a discriminatory. That seems to be the drift oh, at age. The walls, if I may say that, the wall separating the two was brought down yeah. both both kinds of couple uh, both kind of relationships could go for either kind of relationship both both uh, type of couples same sex and heterosexual couples could go either for marriage or for civil relationships yes Lord. yes Lord. now see the result the result that the, the relief which the grant gives us an idea of what was really the issue Yes, the Lord. phrase of different sex in section 44 of the general civil code and the phrases of same sex couples and of same sex in the registered partnership act are therefore repealed as unconstitutional for violating the principle of equality that's right Lord. and what it's saying setting a deadline whatever the finding that earlier provisions shall not re-enter into force is based all right i think uh, thank you miss uh, yes so now i think we'll wrap up at this otherwise we'll Lord, now I, others, as far as others. this judgment is concerned this is over may i just take your there's a south african judgment uh, national association just briefly maybe just one para we can see there Lord, the south african judgment which which is part of my written note and my lord uh, what what it basically is uh, the position was what's the pdf page pdf page pdf page this is part five part five my lord it was with the note so my lord it's just uh, next to the all note right. all right this note Milod, this is case it, was preceded by the form. It's not part of volume four, this national no, volume. No, volume five, then with my note, it's national. No, not. Is it volume five? There's no volume. It's part of the written note that was just the three page of yes, three yes. page one. Yeah. We've seen that national coalition for gay and lesbian. Yes, yes, yes. right, right. Is there? Yes, yes. yes. It's at page four of the note. Are you yes. referring to a particular para? Sorry, Milod. <laughs> Any para number? 
Indeed. Yes, uh, paras which we are relying upon and we are emphasizing our 49, 50, 51, 53 B. Mm -hmm. I want to read some of them, 55, 56, 62, 67, 71, and 72. Just give us the best paragraph. Let's go to that. Yes, my Lord, can I just give the background? That it was basically an interpretation of the Aliens Control Act, which was the immigration law. Okay. My Lord, my Lord, I just give a little background, then I'll just read out three, four of the important paras and be done. My Lord, 25.2 of the Aliens Control Act said that it permitted foreign heterosexual spouses of permanent South African residents to apply for immigration permits, but not to foreign permanent same-sex like partners of such residents. So in that sense, it's paramateria to the petitioners herein. Just read. And the court said that it was an unfair discrimination. So if I may take my lord to your lordships to para 53b and then how it's to be read down, I will just read that. PDF page 34. PDF page 34. Para 53b. Just shorten. The subsection is, have your lordships got it? Yes. Yes. The subsection in this context, in effect, states that all gay and lesbian permanent residents of the Republic who are in the same sex relationships with foreign nationals are not entitled to the benefit extended by the subsection to spouses married to foreign nationals in order to protect their family and family life. That is so stated, notwithstanding that the family and family life which gays and lesbians are capable of establishing with their foreign nationals, same-sex partners, are all significant aspects indistinguishable from those of spouses and in human terms as important to gay and lesbian same-sex partners as they are to spouses. 54, the message and impact are clear. Section 10 of the Constitution recognizes and guarantees that everyone has inherent dignity and the right to have their dignity respected and protected. The, marriage is, the message is that gays and lesbians lack the inherent humanity to have their families and family lives in such same-sex relationships respected or protected. It serves in addition to perpetuate and reinforce existing prejudices and stereotypes. The impact constitutes a crass, blunt, cruel, and serious invasion of their dignity. The discrimination based on sexual orientation is severe because no concern, let alone anything approach approaching equal concern is shown for particular sexual orientation of gays and lesbians. Then, my lords, I just think I should just go to the manner in which it has been read down, read in, page 36 of the, the appropriate remedy, 36 page 36, para 62 of the PDF. What is the appropriate remedy, my lord? It's under appropriate remedy. Lots have it? Yes. 62. As far as the declaration of invalidity is concerned, the High Court considered that three options were open to it. The first was to remedy the constitutional invalidity of 25.5 by introducing reading in words into the section in such a way that its provisions also applied to persons in same-sex life partnerships. The High Court decided against such remedy as an appropriate one, principally because it was of the view it was not possible to define with a sufficient degree or precision, the words that had to be inserted in 25.5 
in order for it to comply with the constitution. The second was, my Lord, can I just take your lordships to 67? Just to precede the time. And I'll just point out the paras that I'm emphasizing at the end of the 39 of PDF. 39 of PDF, para 67. I am persuaded by Mr. Ten Gove's submission that as far as deference to the legislature is concerned, there is in principle no difference between a court rendering a statutory provision constitutional by removing the offending part by actual or notional severance or by reading words into a statutory provision. Uh, in both cases, the parliamentary enactment as expressed in a statutory provision is being altered by the order of a court in one case by excision and the other by addition. Lord, now para 82 PDF. 43. 43. PDF 43, para 82. An appropriate remedy in the present case must vindicate the rights of permanent same-sex life partners to establish a family unit that while retaining the characteristic features derived from its same-sex nature receives the same protection and enjoys the same concern from the law and from society generally as to marriages recognized by law. But it must vindicate at more than an abstract level. It must operate to eradicate these stereotypes, our constitutional commitment to non-discrimination and equal protection demands, uh, this. demands this. Now, Lord, just after reading that, the, uh, the most effective way of achieving this in the present case is by a suitable reading in if this is reasonably possible. So, my Lord, as far as this judgment is concerned, may I just re-emphasize the paras because I couldn't read all of them since I have to keep to some time limit. Paras 49 to 51, 53 to 57. 64, 66, 67, 73, 82. Actually, 86, they read in the words yes. after spouse, mm -hmm. they read the words or partner in a permanent same sex life that's partnership. Right. That's right. Because what they, they you could get an immigration, uh, an immigration permit for a spouse. Now, spouse is interpreted to mean a same uh, a heterosexual uh, spouse. In para 86, they say we will expand that by reading the words or partner in a permanent same sex life partnership. So, my lord, in para 97, uh, they repeat, they give the final summary, and then in 2.1 of 97, at the para 97, 98, I'm sorry, of 98, the omission from 25.5 of the Aliens Control Act, after the word spouse of the words or partner, in a permanent same-sex life partnership, and my lord, I would say LGBT, I, whatever, partnership is declared to be inconsistent with the constitution. And then the next page, 2.2, 2.2, section 25.5 of the Aliens Control Act, to be read as though the following words appear therein, after the word spouse or partner in a partner uh, in a permanent okay, same sex. Mr. Lutra, we've seen it. Thank you, Ms. Lutra. Yes, Thank you Lord. so much. My Lord, just I if I may just end with E. D. Windsor, who was fighting for marriage rights for same sex couples and who said, it's, there's a quote at the bottom, marriage is a magic word and it is magic throughout the world. It has to do with our dignity as human beings to be who we are openly. Thank you, Ms. Pitt. Lord, I'm grateful, my Lord. Lord, I have also talked about workability in my note, as well as the interpretation of the various sections yes. on in, uh, point number eight and how it has to be read in 
we've already read in in her sova mm -hmm. we've read it in in no, gita right. hari haran all right yes. thank you stations. thank you mr lord i'm grateful my lord yes mr grover i'm grateful my lord thank you very much and lord grateful to my lord joseph bhatan just is called my lord for but right. i'm going to be on a slightly different track lord i want you lord just to uh, comment your lordships a slightly different argument borrowed from the us jurisprudence and that my lord is on intimate association that's one on the intimate association yeah but i am representing two two intimate petitions my lord two petitions one is under the foreign marriage act my lord where the couple of indian origin one of them is citizen they got married in the us marriage is valid there and they they actually first came to india both of them are hindus and um, uh they tried to register their marriage here they could not then they went to the us back to the us where they stay and they actually went to the embassy they filled all the forms that was not registered in fact they were not treated very well that is an issue i don't want to get into that the second petition is interfaith christian and hindu and obviously under the special marriage act i'm not going to um, repeat anything that ms luthra has said i'll directly go on to a, an argument which has not been invoked in earlier milan and that is the argument of what is known as intimate association in the us based on the 14th amendment 19th and the first amendment and it would be embraced in article 191c you know the idea is that you can form associations from say cooperative societies to trade unions which are larger groups and intimate associations of a romantic or a marital nature and that is a fundamental right in the us considered to be a fundamental right in the us coupled with free speech because in a larger association you will actually have that group which will be protected by the the right to associate together with privacy say of their names and also to express freely that's that's the point no man so there are three issues three concepts into one but it is encapsulated in our constitution under article 191c a and obviously it will be subject to the reasonable restrictions in as far as c is concerned in 194 or 192 now not this actually arose i don't want to get into in my note which is a uh, written submissions i have given the history of it but i'll just go into couple of judgments my lord which your lordships are otherwise familiar with griswold versus connecticut my lord is one in one judgment where the lordships in the supreme court justice douglas's judgment and he has written a, in the columbia law review a paper on that this is part of your note yes article on that okay uh, it's a well known uh, columbia law review my lord yes, it is mr grover is it the second uh, written note you filed too can you the yes. first one or the second one additional one second one, my second one. additional a to l a to m Lord, the uh, uh, PDF page one two six nine, volume four. I'll just read that paragraph because this is an important paragraph. If I may read that. It's running into one twenty one pages. Your additional note, Mr. Prasad. I can't hear. It's running into one hundred and twenty one pages. It can't. So that's just the, no. I'm on the original uh, volume four, PDF one two six nine. I mean, there are so many volumes that I've lost track of. Presidents. Presidents' volume. Yes, I've got them. Yes, Malone, Justice Bhatt is right. Volume four, page one to one. One two six nine is the last paragraph of Justice the 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 majority judgment of Justice Douglas. Lordships have it. Yes. We deal with the right of privacy older than the Bill of Rights, older than yes. our political parties, older than our school system. Marriage is a coming together for better or worse, hopefully enduring. And intimate to the degree of being sacred. Ah, very good. Oh, you do get it. Sir, one two nine internal page four eight six. One. Result. Uh, yes, Sanjay. This is Connecticut. One two. One, two six, volume four. Nine. Volume. Volume four. Yes, yes, yes. I got it. PDF one two six nine. PDF one two six nine. Two, the six, original nine. volume four uh, compilation of judges. Seven seven. Huh? One two seven seven. Right. It's not. One two six nine. Huh? At one two seven seven.
mine is showing as 1269. That's not uh, 1269. Huh? I'm sorry, my lord. Sister, it's at 1269. Just before the concurring view of Justice Goldberg. My lord is right. Oblige you, lord. Grateful to my lord, Justice so, Goldberg. PDF 1277. All right. I'll just quickly read that. We deal with the right of privacy older than the Bill of Rights, older than our political parties, older than our school system. Marriage is a coming together for better or worse, hopefully enduring and intimate to the degree of being sacred. It is an association that promotes a way of life, not causes, a harmony in living, not political faiths, a bilateral loyalty, not commercial or social projects. It is an association for a noble, uh, for as noble a purpose as any involved in our prior decisions, which are all about larger associations, etc. Now, you know, this actually has been finally given a imprimatur by the Supreme Court in a famous case versus the Roberts versus Jaisis, which is in that additional written submissions, you know. And there, you know, I'm not reading any large passages, but immediately, if your lordships have, if the court has page seven. The lordships have the additional note that we sent last week. And in that, there is Robert versus Jaisis, page seven. On the right hand sides. Under on intimate association. My lord, my lord is absolutely right. Subpara Roman eight. I'm sorry, my lord. Subpara Roman eight refers to Roberts versus the United States. Yes. Subpara eight. Yes. On the main judgment, my lord. So Change. The personal affiliations that exemplify these considerations and therefore suggest some relevant limitations on relationships that might be entitled to this sort of constitutional protection are those that attend the creation of sustenance and family, marriage, the judgments are quoted. Family relationships by their nature involve deep attachments and commitments to the necessarily few other individuals with whom one shares not only a special community of thoughts, experiences, and beliefs, but also Sister, 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 and beliefs, but also distinctively personal aspects of one's life. Among other things, therefore, they are distinguished by such attributes as relative smallness, a high degree of selectivity in decisions, <laughs> to begin and maintain the affiliation and seclusion from others in critical aspects of relationship. As a general matter, only relationship of these sorts of qualities are likely to reflect the considerations that have led to an understanding of freedom of association as an intrinsic element of personal liberty. Conversely, an association lacking these qualities, such as large business enterprises seems report from the concerns giving rise to this constitutional protection. Accordingly, the constitution undoubtedly imposes constraints on the state's power to control the selection of one's spouse that would not only apply to regulations affecting the choice of one fellow's employees. Comparison between the poles, of course, lies a broad range of human relationships that make greater or lesser claims to constitutional protection from particular incursions to the state by the state. Determining the limits of state authority over an individual's freedom to enter into particular associations, therefore, unavoidably entails a careful assessment of where that relationship's objective characteristics locate it on the spectrum from the most intimate to the most attenuated of personal attachments. We need not mark the potentially significant points on this terrain with any precision. We note only that factors that may be relevant include size, purpose, policy, selectivity, congeniality and other characteristics that in a particular case may be pertinent. In this case, however, several features of the JCs clearly place the organization in outside the category of relations worthy of this kind of constitution. In this case, this is association where women were sought to be excluded. <laughs> Immediately next page, and I'll finish on this judgment. 
the first para on the left, an individual freedom to speak to worship. So worship also is hour 25 to petition the government for the redress of grievances could not be vigorously protected from interference by the state unless a correlative freedom to engage in a group effort towards these ends were also not guaranteed. According protection to collective effort on behalf of shared goals is especially important in preserving political and cultural diversity and in shielding dissident expression from suppression by the majority. Consequently, we have long understood the impl as implicit in the right to engage in activities protected by the First Amendment, a corresponding right to associate with others in pursuit of a wide variety of political, social, economic, educational, religious, and cultural. It's very broad, Milan. So while you can have an association, you also have protection in pursuing that. In view of the various protected activities in which the diocese engages, that right is plain, plainly implicated in the case. So Milan, it is now set. But I am commending your lordships to also, apart from privacy, autonomy, and dignity, which we have read into 21, to consider whether we can actually use this. And you know, one author has said this is much more protective than uh, like a 21 uh, uh, privacy. There's only one more. What else, Mr. Grover? Lord, next point I want to make is in Oberfell. Sorry? Obers fell the judgment which actually recognized same sex marriage. I remember I, this is apropos what my Lord Justice but said. Lord, my argument is twofold. They have taken intimate association as one of the criteria. Secondly, my Lord, it was not a case that the, the, the core of the argument, the core of the case is not in holding invalid statutes which did not allow same sex marriage. It is in fact flowing from the 14th, 9th, and the First Amendment, and saying this is the right, and therefore any restrictions have to be held to be not applicable. That is this. And Milad, if you Lord Chief, will just go to Oberswell. And ma'am, Lord Chief, I know that the syllabus cannot be used, but the syllabus is a very precise um, summary and Grover. is by the court itself. And that is belongs Grover. at Mr. Grover. My Lords. That's precisely the point I made, that it can be used only for the purpose of a declaration. It's, it's no legislative content to that. No, I'm sorry. I, I, I understood your lordship, lordship to mean that if there was a statute that they were invalidating, then it may not be applicable to us in our so yes, lordship it was also, yeah. because you had a large number of statutes which prohibited gay uh, relationships or prohibited marriage, there were several constitutions, state constitutions, which enacted prohibitions. Those were outlawed. If you yes. see the schedule to the, I think, majority yes. judgment, the, my Therefore, argument there is... was that part to it, but that was the cause. So okay. in the course of that, they said that there's a right to marriage. So in that, there are two parts. One is the declaratory part. Yes. The second is the consequential, or yeah. rather, the... the I appreciate what my Lord is putting to me. I agree with my Lord. Mayor. Only thing I want to add is that the, the core is not to strike down the statute. And if your Lordships, I'll only point and not read on because it's lengthy. No, no, you Please can't you... say that it wasn't. It was both in order to say that there is a they, that these are in uh, unconstitutional. First, it was necessary to declare that there is a right to marry. Lord, may I commend your Lordships to actually go to the relevant portion, volume four again, two, two three, nine, nine. I'm not going to read it you know, because time is limited. But there is the syllabus, and the syllabus is an accurate summary. And we're not lordships only. I will only read only a portion of that. But I I agree with my lord. Uh, there was that was an incidental thing about invalidating statutes. That was not the core of the argument. So if your lordships have the time and will have the time to read the whole judgment, it'll become very clear. But we're not the. If your lordships will just go to the to the uh, uh, to the uh, page two four zero zero. Volume four. Volume four itself, my lord. Two three nine nine. It starts, and it's interesting what they say, my lord. The principle. PDF two four zero eight. 
two, three, <laughs> you'll learn. My lady says, there's some error. I'm so sorry, I don't know. Okay, you're reading the physical page. We are pointing out the PDF is 2408. My page is 2399, but my lady's page will be slightly different. I think. Obershfell versus Hodges. Uh, syllabus. Learn. Yes, we've got that syllabus. Well, look, there are pages on the top right hand corner. Oh, I'm sorry. You got that. That's yes. a typical yes. page. It's okay. First, come to uh, uh, 2401, four principles. Four principles and traditions demonstrate the reason that marriage is fundamental under the constitution apply equal force to same sex couples. The first premise of the court relevant precedent is the right to personal choice regarding marriage is inherent in the concept of individual autonomy. Then your lordships will come to the second principle. That's where I am coming in, in terms of intimate association. A second principle in this course jurisprudence is the right to marry is, a, is fundamental because it supports a two-person union like any other in its importance to the committed individuals. The intimate association protected by this right was central to Griswold versus Connecticut, which held that the constitution protects the right of married couples to use contraception and was acknowledged in Turner. Supra, the same sex couples have the same right as the opposite sex couple to enjoy intimate association, a right extending beyond mere freedom from laws seeking, making same sex and intimacy a criminal offense. The third basis for protecting the right to marry is that the safeguards of children and families and thus draws meaning for the related rights like childbearing. Then your lordship will come down to the bottom of that page. This does not mean, as your lordship put it, you don't have to have children. This does not mean that the right to marry is less meaningful for those who do not or cannot have children. Precedent protects the right of a married couple not to procreate so that the right to marry cannot be conditioned on the capacity or the commitment. Finally, this court cases and the nation's tradition, your Lordship knows in the US, the traditions are very, very important. Now, so I'm, I'm commending your Lordship to actually use this doctrine of intimate association. That's the point, my Lord. Now, my Lord, second point I want to go into is about transgender people, my Lord. Now, my Lord, there has been a lot of confusion about norms, the gender glossary. So I'm just giving one glossary. Just give it. We'll, we'll be sending it to your lordships. Lord, I'm very sorry that we didn't know that. Lord, this is just the glossary. Your lordships are now. Your lordships got it. I don't know how yes. to give it. Just send it. How will you send it? Can email it. Just email it. Lord, here I want to, your lordships, to go to Nalsa judgment, which is in volume one. What I want to say is, my lord, in the affidavit filed by the Union of India, unfortunately, my lord, they seem to be of the opinion and impression that in ancient India, up to the advent of the British, we did not have non-heterosexual relationships. This is completely incorrect. And there are tomes and tomes of literature now available, which shows that these relationships were prevalent. They're not only prevalent, but scriptures actually record it. So I'll only refer your lordships, the court, to certain this thing, but please see Nalsa. Nalsa is in volume one and pay Paris 13 to 20 because this was argued by us in Nalsa and that's why ultimately they said okay. it is part of our tradition Paris. unlike in Europe in wow. that sense Europe was backward okay. to the British we already had the notion of Trithya Prakriti it was part of our tradition and in terms of marriage marriage between non heterosexual couples transgender and transgender transgender and cis male transgender and cis female was common and it's actually noted in our scriptures also 
Now, volume one, my lord. I'm coming to Ruth Vinita later. Arras 13, my lord. Just see this. And my lord, I'm, I'm sorry to say to, to refer to transgender in a derogatory manner is completely unacceptable. And that was the British notion, not an Indian notion. Unfortunately, my lord, right after the British, we ourselves, people like us, the middle class, upper middle class, have imbibed that prejudice. You have to get rid of it. Even today, it, it is actually prevalent. Lord, para 13. I mean, Lord, the notion of transgender is, transgender is an English term. We had other terms, hijra, jokapa, koti, etc. I mean, where a person would actually take on another gender physically. But in terms of my Lord, thinking in terms of uh, theory, and this is in the Nalsa judgment, my Lord, the Buddhist and the Hindus con construed this as a physical parameter. Whereas Jains in their scriptures considered that as a psychological parameter. So in the 13th and the 14th century, we were much more ahead in thinking than the Europeans. Mm -hmm. To argue that we didn't have this in our country, is completely incorrect. List for appearance. Six, seven, six, six. Hmm? Six, seven. Go through that. Para 14 talks of the various diverse communities of transgenders. Hijras, eunuchs, Kotis, Aravanis, Jokapa, Shiv Shaktis. Then please see Para 15. Lord Rama in the epic Ramayana was leaving for the forest upon being banished from the kingdom for 14 years turns around to his followers and asks all men and women to return to the city. Among his followers, the hijras alone did not feel bound by this direction and decided to stay with him. Impressed by their devotion, Rama sanctions them okay, for the power to... We read that, yes. We, we Para your point. Para I'm not going to read it, now. All I'm saying is that this is well known. It is now incorporated in a judgment. I'm not relying on literature. It's an incorporated. And we see Para 17, which I was referring to. Jain texts make a detailed reference to transgenders, which mentions the concept of psychological sex. That's why Nalsa then actually incorporated these notions and said a person can actually be born as a male and he can say from tomorrow, psychologically, I'm a woman. I'll assume the woman form and it is his or her right, autonomous right, to assume that form. It is not through the intervention of the state. That's what Nalsa says. Uh, ultimately, my lord, your lordships have the Transgender Act. And the Transgender Act, Act actually under Section 4 confers, 4 to 7 actually confers the right. And my lord, it gives protection to those persons who are actually certified to be transgender under that act. But you can first be a transgender, then you can assume the male or the female form through certification. Now, very importantly, my lord, what has happened is, just see this. If I am a male person, cis male, I marry a woman, cis woman, my marriage is valid according to the law. During the subsistence of the marriage, I actually assume a female gender, either through transition or otherwise. The law does not say that the marriage becomes void or voidable. In fact, it recognizes it under the Transgender Act and the Transgender Rules. That is the state of affairs under the present law. And secondly, my lord, certain states, including Kerala, and I've given that form, my lord, they are encouraging, I've got the translated, my lord, I have to translate that. They are encouraging people who are married and they're actually being financed. So that they can actually, so states are recognizing these marriages. But I don't have much time. I don't want to, I'll, I'll stick to my time. You have read and understood this? Uh, I'm sorry? You read and understood this? I'm sorry, I can't. It's in Malayalam. No, no there is Malayalam and English. Translation, sir. You know, your ship doesn't have the English one? You, no, you gave the... Uh, <laughs> Give the English one, please. We had to translate it from uh, uh, a learned advocate practicing in this court, my lord, who understands Malayalam very well. 
ठीक है ना या बट देयर माइट बी सम कंसीडरेशंस देयर बिकॉज़ इफ देयर इज एन एग्जिस्टिंग मैरिज माय लॉर्ड्स and that existing marriage res- has resulted in let's say children and a family mm. this this kind of if this is not preserved that will lead to perhaps that some untoward or adverse consequences to members of that family your lordship is absolutely right but yes. at the same time one could also in this is a situation where the legislature would have said that no it's void or voidable because no, if you change your religion then the, right then then you are looking at a legislature which doesn't take into account realities no mm. so here here there is it's a different kind of reality which you are wanting the legislature to take care of whereas that's yes. a, another situation where the parties have you know a certain something has happened which they don't want it to result in consequences which is not to the not of the making of Uh, the other parties who may be deemed innocent or whatever we don't know ordinarily Even... suppose a person actually reassigns his or her gender in a marriage the other party would say i want to divorce you the legislature has not taken that view the legislature no, actually... over that too is an assumption that too is an assumption based on with all due respect certain classes because if if you if you do that in a certain community you may lose your status you may, we don't know how things work out it's a very plural and diverse society uh, very well not that that's a that's justice, one of the issues that just as call would you want to take a little break a 5 minute break or something uh, no i am finishing 2 minutes not i am good uh, just a two for the time yeah. i'm good i can continue if you want all right i won't take much time i'll finish all in the next 5 minutes the third point i want to make my lord is that there has been argument on the other side that it is for parliament to legislate on this issue but let us look at yes let us look at the record issues have been coming up and i have given my lord a, a document by what is known as the pink list india they have been actually observing and monitoring what is happening to lgbtqi issues in parliament and there has been no positive response for the last 5 years my lord on doing anything positive about this issue so can we expect my lord and when in obak fell this was another issue i didn't read that part they also were told by the respondent states that we we should wait for parliament and they said no we are not going to wait because the parliament has disclosed its hand earlier or rather the us congress there and the final point i want to make is about the so called elitism there are large number of people are actually running away from their homes couples same sex couples they run away from their homes and orders are available on the net and we have we have compiled about 10 orders and if your lordships will actually look at those orders the origins of those people are from small towns they are not from calcutta delhi etc they are from very small towns they come to the capital city where the high court is and they need protection right now my lord there is a case going on that we i am handling where two women have come to delhi from a rural area and that those two people have no place to stay they are poor people they don't have the money if they you have the money you can afford to hire lawyers etc but most of the people who are runaway couples same sex couples are poor people they are coming from small towns they come to the main city in the state because the high court is there so i have actually my lord compiled those orders and if logic only looks at the facts it's not it's anecdotal it's not completely uh, methodologically methodologically correct but it would be evident they're not elitist so therefore my lord this notion that this is elitist is incorrect lord i'm sticking to my time i'm much of oh, no lord only one two things hmm? no no my lord there is uh, in my written submissions just go there now in my written submissions i would be not doing my duty as it were if i did not read that portion you know there's a poem which you know i'll commend you lot of reading that in the beginning now this is interesting is from khalil gibran then almira spoke again and said and what of marriage master and he answered saying you were born together and together you shall be forever more 
you shall be together when white wings of death scatter your days. I, you shall be together even in the silent memory of God. But let there be spaces in your togetherness and let the winds of heaven dance between you. Love one another, but make not a bond of love. Love one another, but make not a bond of love. Let it rather be a moving sea between the shores of your souls. Fill each other's cup, but drink not from the same cup. Give one another your bread, but eat not from the same loaf. Sing and dance together and be joyous. But let each one of you be alone, even as the strings of a lute are alone, though they quiver with the same music. Give your hearts, but not unto each other's keeping, for only the hand of life can contain your hearts. Lord, I only want to say that this would have not been possible for me, were it not for Justice A.P. Shah, Justice Murlidhar, and your lordships in the in the Navdeh Johar judgment, and my mentors, you know, Justice Kirby and Justice Cameron. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Grover. So we'll now uh, have uh, the arguments of Ms. Jaina Kothari. Please, my lords, may please report. My lords, I appear in the matter of Dr. Akkai Padmashali and others versus Union of India, my lords. I have submitted a uh, supplement submission, which is a five-page note. It is uh, there in the written submission folder, but I also have now, two copies, my lords, which I'm... What would you be... Uh, what's the point with that you're going my to... My lords, this is just a more summarized version. That's all for today, since I just have 20 minutes. It's called, my lords, supplementary submissions. It's a five-page... Yes, I've got it. ...which I have submitted. And if my lords, Justice Call yes. and Justice Bhatt also have it. Yes, we've got it. Grateful, my lords, grateful. Yes. My lords, I have three points to make and I'll stick to my time. My lords, our first claim, my lords, this is the second petition for transgender persons. The only other petition was by uh, Mr. K. V. Vishwanathan of Zaina Patel. My lords, our claim here is for marriage equality for all, not just same-sex marriage, my lords. We are seeking that there should be marriage for all persons, irrespective of gender identity or sexual orientation. And that is our fundamental claim. And I pray, my lords, that that claim or that framing be given to this matter, my lords. My lords, the first issue, very briefly, because it has been covered, is on transgender persons' right to gender identity. I'm not going to labor it much. But my lords, some points need to be clarified. My lords, trans persons are persons whose gender does not match the sex assigned to them at birth. So therefore, they may be born as male or female and whatever sex may be assigned to them at birth, but they identify with a different gender. And therefore, under NALSA, this gender identity and the right to self-determine one's gender identity was protected by this honorable court. And this honorable court held that it is not only two genders, not just male or female, but male, female, or transgender. You could identify with either any of those gender identities, even without medical reassignment. And the purpose, my lords, of granting this right to self-determine one's gender identity is to get legal recognition to a whole bunch of other rights. It could be the right to vote. It could be the right to get a driver's license, including the right to marry, which was read out. In, in, and I've written the para numbers. The right to marry of transgender persons also was specifically recognized under NALSA. My lords, in practice, what happens is that despite the recognition of one's gender identity, trans persons, my lords, are unable to exercise their full legal rights for many reasons. One, that despite NALSA, they still have to undergo medical reassignment to get their documents changed. A large number of them are not able to do that. And unless they get their medical documents changed, they don't get the access to a whole bundle of rights. In fact, technically, one could say that under the Special Marriage Act, if you come within a man or woman technically and have documents to show that, you may even be allowed to marry. But my lords, how many persons are even able to do that? And what about persons who identify not as the binary genders, but as transgender? There is no coverage of that. Yes. And my lords, there are intersex persons as well, and which are not covered at all. My lords, my second point is that is on the right to family. My lords, the right to family, that is my second main point, the right to family to be recognized under the right to life under Article 21. 
My lords, the petitioner, Dr. Akai Padmashali, she was born male. She faced so much violence at her parental home and family that she had no other option but to leave her home when she was about 14, 15 years old. She was on the streets without her family, begging and into sex work. That is, my lords, what a majority of transgender persons have no other option but to do when they are forced to leave their homes. And therefore, my lords, what does the right to family mean? My lords, the right to marry in this case, what we're asking for the Special Marriage Act to cover. The right to marry has been upheld in a whole variety of judgments of my lords. There's Shakti Vahini, uh, Shafin Jahan, and all of that has been read out. But my lords, the right to marry gives rise to a family, a kind of family, which my lords is also a fundamental mm -hmm. right and has to be recognized under Article 21. My lords, we can have families by blood, marriage, adoption, mm -hmm. but marriage is one way in which we have a family and an important way. Couples can decide to marry and not have children. Couples may decide to have children. And then their family unit is either the two spouses or with their children. And my lords, what does a family do? My lords, it goes to the core of our being. I read out, having the love, care, and support of a family is an essential ingredient for a person to live a full life. My lords, our families give us not only find, uh, love and care, but they give us psychological support. They give us economic support. Our family is the only unit it is the basic unit in society that we turn back to when we are in any kind of trouble. And my lords, can, therefore, do we not have the right to have our family recognized and the right to form our family, my lords? And that is the right I'm asking has to be recognized under Article 21. My lords, trans persons are already having their families. They are in long-term relationships. They are adopting children and they are maintaining their families. But these families are not recognized because, my lords, marriage is not permitted. And therefore, my lords, family is not just a heterosexual phenomenon. My lords, the importance of the family as an integral part of one's personality has already been recognized to some extent under the right to privacy. And my lords, if I may just, I've extracted a couple of paragraphs. And my lords, that's in my note in para 9. May I please uh, refer to those paras, my lords? That's para 271. Uh, it's in my notes, so my lords may not have to take the trouble of uh, referring to the uh, Putiswami judgment. Para 271, my lords held. We need also emphasize the lack of substance in the submission that privacy is the privilege for the few. Every individual in society, irrespective of social class or economic status, is entitled to the intimacy and autonomy which privacy protects. The sanctity of marriage the liberty of procreation, the choice of a family life, and the dignity of being are matters which concern every individual, irrespective of social strata or economic well-being. The pursuit of happiness is founded about, upon autonomy and dignity. Both are essential attributes of privacy, which makes no distinction between the birthmarks of individuals. Therefore, my lords, marriage, procreation, family life choice are all separately uh, uh, refer to my lords. Then my lords in para 298, it, it follows my lords. The intersection between one's mental integrity and privacy entitles the individual to freedom of thought, the freedom to believe in what is right, and the freedom of self-determination. When these guarantees intersect with gender, they create a private space which protects all those elements which are crucial to gender identity. Specifically in the context of gender identity, my lords held the family, marriage, procreation and sexual orientation are all integral to the integrity of the individual. Above all, the privacy of the individual recognizes an inviolable, inviolable right to determine how freedom shall be exercised. And lastly, my lords, in the same judgment, Justice Call's uh, referral in Paris 645, it is an individual's choice as to who enters his house, how he lives and in what relationship. The privacy of the home must protect the family marriage, procreation, and sexual orientation, which are all important aspects of dignity. My lords, recently, my lords in the Deepika case, in fact, refer to unconventional families. My lords, we are dealing with unconventional families and have recognized them. And it is not just the marital tie, but what is the concept of family? And my lords, 
uh, refer to, and I will just read out 1 para 26. The predominant understanding of the concept of family, both in the law and in society, is that it consists of a single unchanging unit with a mother and a father who remain constant over time and their children. This assumption ignores both the many circumstances which may lead to a change in one's familial structure and the fact that many families do not conform to this assumption to begin with. Familial relationships may take form of domestic, unmarried partnerships or queer relationships. Household may be a single parent household for any number of reasons, including the death of a spouse, separation or divorce. Similarly, the guardians and caretakers who traditionally occupy the roles of the mother and father of children may change with remarriage, adoption or fostering. These manifestations of love and families may not be typical, but they are as real as their traditional counterparts. Such atypical manifestations of the family unit are equally deserving not only of protection under the law, but also of the benefits available under welfare, social welfare legislation. The black letter of the law must not be relied on to disadvantage families which are different from traditional ones. So therefore, my lords, I ask, should, relation, should families where persons are trans or of a different sexual orientation, can they be denied of the right to have a family life? And my lords, interestingly, the Delhi High Court in a 2021 judgment in Lakshmi Bhavya Taneru, this was in the case of a heterosexual couple which didn't have children. They wanted to be together. And the court, in fact, for the first time held uh, that this would come under Article 21, and I would read out, my lords. We have no doubt the right to a meaningful family life, which allows a person to live a fulfilling life and helps in retaining her or his physical, psychological, and emotional integrity would have a place in the four corners of Article 21 of the Constitution. My lords, is a family different just because your gender identity is different? Are these not the same values that all of us want at the end of the day? And so therefore, my lords, uh, I argue that this should fall under Article 21. And my lords, this has been recognized in European jurisprudence and in some of the international treaties. And I've just had a reference of these for my lords' reference. My lords, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the 1948 document, uh, while it refers to men and women because gender identity was not an issue at that time, it still recognizes under Article 16, men and women of full age without any limitation due to race, nationality, or religion have the right to marry and to found a family. My Lords, that's what I want to insist on. They are entitled to equal rights to marriage, during marriage, and its dissolution. The ICCPR, my Lords, in uh, 66 held under Article 23 -1, the family is the natural and fundamental group unit of society and is entitled to protection by society and the state. My lords, we have signed up to ICCPR. The right of men and women of marriageable age to marry and to found a family shall be recognized. And my lords, the European Union, of course, has separate fundamental rights on this. The Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU, my lords, in Article 9 holds, all persons have the right to marry and the right to found a family. And the European Convention on Human Rights, my lords, Article 8 and 12. Article 8 states that everyone has the right to respect for his family and private life, his home and his correspondence. Article 12 states that men and women of marriageable age have the right to marry and to found a family according to national laws governing the exercise of this right. My lords, the Yogyakarta principles, which were relied upon in the, by this honorable court in Nalsa, in fact, has a specific article on the right to have a family in the context of marriage. And my lords, that is principle 24, which I've extracted. Everyone has the right to found a family, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity. It reiterates what my lords, in fact, said in Deepika. Families exist in diverse forms. No family may be subjected to discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity or of any of its members. And it, in fact, calls for states to ensure that laws and policies recognize the diversity of family forms and to ensure that in states that recognize same-sex marriages or registered partnerships, any entitlement, privilege, obligation, or benefit available to different sex married or registered partners is equally available to same-sex married or registered partners. My lords, there are two decisions. Uh, I will not go into those, but my lords, O'Leary and others versus Italy, this was an issue where same-sex marriage was not recognized in Italy, 
and the court held that the denial of recognition of same-sex marriage amounts to a violation of their right to family life. Um, and my Lord, in Christine Goodwin versus UK, this was a case wherein my Lords, the European Court of Human Rights held that transgender persons do have the right to marry. And that flows from the uh, fundamental uh, article 12, which is the right to found a family. And therefore, my Lords, I would argue that we have to recognize that there is a fundamental right to family under Article 21. And in order to exercise that, the right to marry has to be granted. My Lords, finally, uh, of course, the Special Marriage Act and the manner in which it is construed presently by focusing only on men and women denies transgender persons the right to marry and have a family solely on the basis of their gender identity. That, my Lords, amounts to uh, a 15 one discrimination on the basis of sex. My Lords, before I go on to just my last para, I have given a proposed reading mm -hmm. of the Special Marriage Act, uh, which replaces men or women with persons or spouses. It's for my Lord's consideration. Uh, it's there. It's in fact on the last page of the submission. Page six, it is at the end of the submission. And my Lord's, so therefore my submission is that all references to male or female be referred to, be read to refer to as persons and all references to husband or wife be referred to as spouses to include all persons irrespective of their gender and sexual orientation. And I have given a formulation of that. My Lords, I want to just end with a reference from Navtej. My Lords, ultimately, these issues of marriage rights, my Lords, our argument is that it is marriage rights for all. These amount to ensuring that all of us have equal marriage rights, not just one group or the other. And my Lords, this was, in fact, uh, reiterated by my lords in Navtej, and if I can just refer to the last para, my lords, that is para 425, yes. and I have quoted it. The struggle of citizens belonging to sexual minorities is located within the larger history of the struggles against various forms of social subordination in India. The order of nature that section 371 speaks of is not just about non-procreative sex, but is about forms of intimacy which the social order finds disturbing. This includes various forms of transgression, such as intercaste and intercommunity relationships, which are sought to be curbed by society. What links LGBT individuals to couples who love across caste and community lines is the fact that both are exercising their right to love at enormous personal risk and in the process disrupting existing lines of social authority. Just thus, a reimagination of the order of nature as being not only about the prohibition of non-procreative sex, but instead about the limits imposed by structures such as gender, caste, class, religion, and community mm -hmm. makes the right to love not just a separate battle for LGBT individuals, mm -hmm. but a battle for us all. I, My Lord, that's what I would. I was reflecting on. Yes. Therefore, my lords, I submit that these are issues that need to be addressed. And I pray that. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. My lords, I have also submitted, I won't go into it, I've submitted uh, a, an article from the Cardozo Law Review on the right to family relating to same sex relationships. It is there for my lords' reference. I leave it at that. Thank you, Ms. Kudai. Very grateful. Our brothers, Brother Call, Justice, Brother Bhatt, uh, we have about four minutes left. Should we come back after lunch and uh, hear Ms. Uh, Dr. Uh, Gurswami after lunch, if that's all right with both of you? Yes, I think that's better because she is to take about the thing. have a exactly. Yes. So, a better. so, Dr. Fulswami, we will hear you after lunch. Grateful, my lords. Grateful. Grateful, my lords. You brothers after lunch. Okay, thank you.
Yes, Dr. Gurusan. My Lord, uh, Justices Bhatt and Justice Call is here, my Lord. Sorry. Yes, Justice uh, Call is joined. And uh, yes. yeah, Justice Bhatt is also on screen. My Lord, sorry. my Lord, may I say that that was the most nerve wracking lunch of my life. Why is that? Because, my Lords, I was thinking about how do I sum up a conversation that perhaps Mr. Kripal, Ms. Kaju, and I have contemplated having in this court for perhaps many decades of our life. That is why. So I went high on sugar and low on carb, my Lords, at lunchtime. My Lords, I am not going to belabor or repeat any point and i assure you that but i am going to make five submissions my submissions have been substituted as my lord knows that this is a different act so these submissions are with regard to writ petition civil 1141 of 2022 miss aditi anand and others versus union of india challenging the Special Marriage Act. I also appear, my lords, today for DCPCR, the Delhi Commission on the Protection of Ch Children's Rights. And their IA is 71983. Now, I will make five distinct points on the writ petition, and I will make two very short submissions on DCPCR's intervention. My lords, have my substituted submissions, my lord? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this will do instead of the... Uh, yes, my lord. It is, it's a substitution. It's not an ancillary. It's a substitution. Yes, you got it. There are long annexures because we did not have benefit of the compilation since this yeah. is a substitution. My lords, my five distinct points are one this. Contrary to what the union has advanced in its counter and in its opposition in court, India's parliament, in India, the parliamentary form of government that we adopted as we the people when the constitution was adopted, unlike England, is a constrained parliamentary form. In England, parliament is sovereign. In India, simply put, parliament is constrained. Constrained by what? Constrained by the constitution as interpreted by whom? Your, my lords. That is the separation of powers formula that we the people gave ourselves. So to say that this is a matter for parliament, is not just unknown to the Indian parliamentary form, which is constrained by the constitution, but in fact seeks to impose a British parliamentary model, which has no place in this jurisdiction. That is point one, my lords. I'll very briefly take you to two extracts. One, pre Keshavananda. Delhi Laws Act, very brief extract, my lords, and one post Keshavananda, Subcommittee yeah. on Judicial Accountability. Everything is in the submissions, my lords. I will not trouble you with the compilation. I will take you only to those extracts. Second point, my lords. Yes. Judicial review is part of basic structure. Of course, my lords, it's well established. Keshavananda, Minerva Mills, so on and so forth. Dr. Ambedkar in the Constituent Assembly debate says Article 32 is the soul of India's constitution. Why is this important? Because we, these petitioners in 19 petitions, speaking for if arguably 5 to 7 percent of any country's population identifies as LGBTQ, then speaking on behalf of millions of Indians, come to my lords. To say this and this alone, that our Article 32 rights are violated. And as my Lord, the Chief Justice said, 
most importantly in this preamble, that we the people gave ourselves. The people of India having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic and to secure to all its citizens. That's 32. So the government of India cannot come to court and say that we the people and we may be a minority or a substantial part of this population cannot come to court and say that this is a matter of parliament because our article 32 rights, the right of judicial review is part of the basic structure of this constitution of which this basic structure doctrine we have now celebrated five decades. Those five decades belong to LGBTQ people also. My Lord's point three. And again, I will only take my Lord to the specific paragraphs. What is the point two? My Lord's point two is article 32. All right, that's all. Yes, my Lord's. It's point two. And I'll take my Lord's. That's also the second point of the written submissions, my Lord's. My Lord's have the index. So I won't trouble my Lord's with repeating any points that have been dealt with. My lady, Justice Kohli has the index also, my lady. Yeah. I'm grateful. Point three, my lords. The union in its counter has said to us that they have a legitimate state interest in proscribing this nature of marriage. My lords, the Chief Justice, nine judges in Puttuswami have interpreted legitimate state interest as specifically pertaining to national security, crime, innovation, and dissipation, prohibiting dissipation of social welfare benefits. That is the understanding of when can the state ascribe and highlight such legitimate state interest. This is point three. Nowhere in these cases, in these petitions, does the state meet that heightened requirement. I'll take my lords to the two relevant paragraphs there, which are also in my written submissions. That is point three. Point four, my lords, in response to earlier questions on day one and day two, we discussed that marriage was a bouquet of rights. And what is that bouquet of rights? The table of benefits, my lords. Very briefly, I'll discuss that. It's part of the written submission, so I won't belabor it. But these benefits include gratuity, provident fund, and my lords, dare I say, pension of judges, including Supreme Court judges, are all premised on the understanding of one thing and one thing alone, a spousal relationship created by marriage. We are excluded from all of that. That is my table of benefits at page 35 of the written submissions. That is point four. Point five, my lord, that marriage is a matter of conscience under Article 25 of the Constitution of India. Now, my lords have heard arguments on Article 14, 15, 19, 21. They are all extracted in my submissions. I adopt my comrades at the bar who have advanced those arguments. I'm not going to repeat them. They're part of my written submissions. But marriage is also a matter of conscience under Article 25 of the Constitution. And that is my point five. Finally, my lords, there is a workability table. I will not trouble my lords, but just to say that it is part of the submissions. But the final point I want to say, and I will come back to this also when I deal with the submissions of the statutory body that is DCPCR is that our annexure six in my submissions is the only study that is based in India. It has 5,800 respondents and the study speaks to one, the journey post Johar, how it has impacted LGBTQ people and two, how marriage equality will impact LGBTQ people. And that is a substantial portion of the annexure that is part of these written submissions. I couldn't put it in the compilation because at that time I was on a different brief. 
And of course, my Lord knows that the Indian Psychiatric Society has also released a statement commending marriage equality. My Lord, may I first take you very briefly to the first submission, my Lord. And I will only read very specific paragraphs and I will not trouble my lords beyond that. That the Indian parliament is a creature of the constitution and does not enjoy unfettered sovereignty. May I only take you to one paragraph, my lord. And this is, my lords, as part of my written submission, page 6, para 11. Just page 6, my lord. Just one paragraph of my submissions. My lords have parallel, yes. my lords. Yes. I'm just going to read from the middle of this paragraph. This is what your lordships in a seven judge bench of this honorable court in Delhi Laws Act 1912. My lord, just this call has the submissions, my lord. Yes, yes. we are have it. Thank you, my lord. In the middle of this paragraph, para 12, this is how your lordships and seven judges in 1951 distinguish India's parliament from that of Britain. My lords say, the Indian parliament is a creature of the constitution. Its powers, rights, privileges, and obligations have to be found in the relevant articles of the constitution. It is not a sovereign body, uncontrolled with unlimited powers. The constitution of India has conferred on the Indian Parliament powers to make laws in respects of matters specified in appropriate places. The following sentence, and it is constrained in particular by articles found in part three dealing with fundamental rights. But Ms. Uh, Dr. Guruswami. Yes, my lord. The point really is that the fact that the canvas which is covered by these petitions also falls within the, or does fall, let me not say also, does fall within the domain of parliament is undisputed. Uh, you cannot dispute the fact that parliament has legislative power over the canvas which is covered by these petitions, which is entry five of the concurrent list. My Lord. Because just let's see entry five of the concurrent list of the constitution. Yes, Lord. It specifically covers marriage and divorce, infants and minors, adoption, yes, wills, interstice and succession, joint family and partition, all matters in respect to which parties and judicial proceedings were immediately before the commencement of the constitution subject to their personal law. My Lord. Right? Therefore, uh, Entry 5 also recognizes the position that all matters which prior to the constitution were a part of personal law fall now within the domain of parliament under entry 5 of list 3. Therefore, we, there's no gainsaying the fact that parliament does have. So, for us to say that, you know, uh, to accept the submission of the union would be to transplant the British parliamentary model may not be entirely correct. You are right that the British parliament, at least before the, uh, before the uh, Human Rights Act, yes. was untrammeled. It was a sovereign, uh, it was an expression of the sovereign will yes, of the people. And therefore, judicial review couldn't certainly extend to uh, striking down law. Even today, you have the doctrine of incompatibility. But equ equally, uh, that really begs the question because our parliament has specific jurisdiction legis in legislative terms uh, by virtue of Article 4, 246, read with entry 5 of List 3. My Lord. To legislate on this area. My Lord. Now the question which we really therefore have to pose is that uh, if this is a power which is conferred specifically on the parliament, does the court then, where does the court really exercise jurisdiction? Very which well. are those interstices which are left open for the court to uh, exercise its powers? I, I don't think we can take it that far to say that, you know, uh, as you have said in your first point, that uh, that to say that this is a matter for parliament seeks to impose a British parliament reform. That may be a very, you know, it may not be really a very correct way of stating it. My lords, may I, may I respond with this, my lords? 
the argument, my lords, is simply this, that in these areas where there has been legislation, the Special Marriage Act, for instance, in these areas where there has been legislation, the Special Marriage Act read in conjunction with well-established case law by my lords, both this nature of case, what is the function, what is the width and ambit of parliament, along um, with cases like Puttuswami and Johar, which my lords have made clear that fundamental rights cannot be trammeled. The argument is simply this, that these have to be read conjun conjointly, that we cannot have a situation where the state, when it is remiss, either in discussing something, in creating that positive obligation that my lords have spoken about, both in Puttaswami and in Johar. Dr. Guruswami, yes, yes, on, on the same note, when you're casting a positive obligation yes. on the lawmakers, just go back yes. to the point of time of article, okay. look at article 17. It says accessibility is forbidden and it's an offense. It yes. opposes the creation of a law. And the first law that we had was in Civil Rights Act 1955. My Lord. You're aware of that? Yes, my Lord. But it was felt to be inadequate. What did the court do? Did the court step in and say this is wrong? According to you, it can. That's one situation. We are in a situation where there is no law. There is no Civil Rights Act. And something as assertive, as positive as 17, if we were to be enforced, how would the court deal with it? We are one step ahead and one step backward also. If it is forbidden and it's an offense, and to be an offense, you need a law. I, yeah, fo you understand that. I, Therefore, I, I follow. Horizontal right I, as well. Yes. So there is a concomitant, you know, both things are to go together. That right has to be translated into law. And you can't have a wider right than that. To my mind, there is no right other than Article 17, which is cast in the, in the most absolute terms. And yet, mm -hmm. that depended, because you are dealing with an offense, that de depended upon the lawmaker, left it to the lawmaker to lay out the conditions in which an offense could be created. Because after all, then you're dealing with someone else's life, liberties, right? Yes. So therefore, that legislative vacuum had to be addressed by parliament through an enactment. So we are almost at that situation. If, but with not such a wide right. It's a derivative right as of now because of a, a kind of seamless web which you are trying to expound that the judgments of the court starting with decriminalization, a general right of privacy, you're stitching it all and saying that there is a an organic growth, which means that you have a right to marry. Therefore, there, there is need for recognition. My lords, I follow and I'm grateful, Justice, but I'm grateful. My lords, if we read Article 17, if I may, if I may, with your permission, Untouchability is abolished and its practice in any form is forbidden. The enforcement of any disability arising out of untouchability shall be an offense punishable in accordance with law. So the text of the Constitution and the drafters made it incumbent upon the legislature to have an enactment, an act of parliament that would in fact make this an implementable criminal offense. Yeah, even without that, you could have had it. Even course. without that, you could, even mm -hmm. without those, in the absence of that term, it was still possible for parliament to enact it. But why did they have it? They cast an obligation. Therefore, there are different kinds of rights in the fundamental rights chapter. Now, what you are saying is something which is now recognized as a right, necessarily has to be translated into law. That is where I think the Chief Justice's question is very important. Why not?
unless we create an obligation because short of an obligation of that kind how do we how do we weave out an obligation or a mandate my lord my respect now take so putta swami itself putta swami really arose in the context of aadhar when the aadhar challenge was laid before our court yes my lord then attorney general mr rodgi argued that there is no right to privacy based on a judgment of the court our court which had held that there is no uh, right to privacy but then there were views say in khadak singh and following cases which said that there is a right to privacy when putta swami came before the court specifically in the context of informational privacy which was really the backdrop to book putta swami the concluding part of the judgment says that we would expect that parliament should come out with a draft bill or, or, or a law on privacy by then you know some some steps had been taken because the shri krishna commission had been the shri krishna committee had been constituted we took note of what had been done by parliament namely the constitution of the shri krishna committee obviously we couldn't issue a, ma a mandamus to the uh, legislature and that we said that this is what we have been assured so even in the context of privacy the the thing is that these rights the court has contemplated have to be fleshed out by the by the legislature there are cases of course vishakha is the classical example where the court has laid down a framework pending the legislature stepping in and uh, and creating a, a law specifically on 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 the safety of women in the workplace but the test really is this how far does the court go because as your submissions and this is something which council which follow you who should also also address us all your submissions willy nilly would have some bearing on how we understand the impact of our decision as you want it to be albeit in the context of the special marriage act on issues which will relate to personal law because there is no doubt about the fact that you know adoption succession interstice these are all matters which are governed by the personal law even today my lord adoption today apart from by the juvenile justice act my lord it's also by the civil but, law but you also have the hindu succession and adoptions uh, the hindu adoptions and maintenance act you do my lords but the now the legislative mandate for adoption in general is the coverage of the juvenile justice act which was adopted more recently it is a civil law and it that cuts across the, communities the, it cuts yeah, across religious my lord that is true because for the longest time there was a problem in enacting a law a temp, you know a, a, a general law but let's not also undermine the hindu adoptions and maintenance act because apart from juvenile justice which you would now for that is also one of the laws and that does lay out certain conditions and that would come on those who are uh, of that of that um, you know faith yes and likewise um, there is no other law other than the the 2016 act there is no other law my lord sir may i now answer these questions serial wise my lords if i may first my lord justice bhat respectfully my lords my assessment my lords and and it is far more limited uh, than than my lords assessment my assessment of article 17 is that it mandates that the legislature create law to convert article 17 into an implementable criminal offence hence the language in article 17 the text of the constitution saying punishable in accordance with law Correct. and similarly my lords may i just add this similarly 21a when i was my lords and this was perhaps the first constitutional big constitutional rights case i argued the right to education act article 21a and we were before then chief justice kapadia and one of the points that justice kapadia made to me was that even pre 21a even pre the legislative enactment the courts had been actively involved in implementing and enforcing this right to education and he took us through case law he said you see this 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 21a and the legislative intent only comes later 
my lords have been that north star not just for lgbtq rights my lords have been that north star in many facets of fundamental rights pre the legislature walking the talk so we don't ask for anything that special today with respect we only ask for a workable interpretation my lords of the special marriage act and council after council council after council have presented workability tables to my lords as have i if it is a question of reading spouse instead of husband or wife that is one option if it is a question of expanding the definition and reading in a constitutionally tenable technique that is an option if it is a question of taking from 13 of the general clauses act where male includes female that is an option we have interpretive options available to this august constitutional court we only ask for a constitutionally tenable interpretation per puttu swami per johar pre keshavananda post keshavananda including keshavananda that's what we ask for our basic structure is also intertwined with keshava and minerva and what follows after that that is the purpose of point number 1 we are not that discreet that distinct that devoid of basic structure that we will not be read into minerva keshava and the cases that follow we are part of we the people and we are citizens of this country basic structure also belongs to us 32 is also our soul and parliament cannot be the reason to exclude us from this gamut of our constitution please interpret it Now, my lords, may I just take my lords to page twelve of my submissions? My lords, this is paragraph twenty-three, where the preamble is extracted, and I just wanted to end on this point, which my lord, the Chief Justice, had alluded to on day one, paragraph twenty-four. the right to move this court for enforcement of fundamental rights under 32 gives effect to the phrase to secure to all its citizens that parliament is a creature of the constitution and is bound by it and within these submissions my lord and i'm not going to belabor this but if my lords just turns to page 14 of the submissions and this is from as my lord said puttu swami which originates from aadhar but makes a very important point of constitutional principle whether it's with privacy or whether it's with aadhar but it is a point of constitutional principle that nine judges of this august constitutional court made and may i just read those four lines my lord on page 14 paragraph 144 the purpose of elevating certain rights to the stature of guaranteed fundamental rights is to insulate their exercise from the disdain of majorities whether legislative or popular the guarantee of constitutional rights does not depend upon their exercise being favorably regarded by majoritarian opinion and my lords when dr ambedkar was confronted with exactly this question whether indian society was ready for the reform that is the hindu code and what about a majority and how does a majority feel he said this he said 
that it is not a question of numbers. It is not a question of majorities and minorities. It is a question of conscience. I would submit, my lords, that by insulating fundamental rights from the whims and vagaries of majorities and minorities, this constitutional court has created a constitutional principle that Dr. Ambedkar called conscience. My lords have called insulating their exercise from the disdain of majority. From 1951 to Puttaswamy in 2017, from Dr. Ambedkar to Puttaswamy in 2017, the thread of conscience being the test for fundamental rights is a haloed constitutional principle. The chairperson of the drafting committee felt so. My lords have felt so. That there is certain basic rights that are not subject to the whims and vagaries of either a legislature that does not create that positive enactment, which the Supreme Court of the United States in Obergfeld said that that constitutional conversation is a continuing one. Dr. Guruswami, you are right in asserting that marriage itself is a bouquet of rights. And you identify three, gratuity, provident oh. fund, pension. Actually, it doesn't stop at that at all. I think the most important social security, which is provided to spouses between each other, Yes, my lord. Apart from, of course, the spousal comfort and uh, consortium, is your entitlement upon the death of a spouse, yes. say in the case of a motor accident or natural death? Yes. yes. Now, if we declare, as you say, using the SMA, that, you know, substitute the word spouse for uh, husband and wife or substitute person for man and woman, for the moment, you know, take it for the granted. That's that, that, that's a simple act of uh, reading up or reading down the statute. But then can we stop at that today? Can we stop at that and say that, look, we'll go so far and no further. What happens? Suppose there are two Hindu women who have then married. I or there are two Hindu men who have married. And you have one of them dies. Can the court today then say that we will not go into what will happen, suppose, in the case of intestacy? Because there the Hindu Succession Act says, in the event of a Hindu male dying intestate, property will devolve in the following manner. But there's a clear distinction between what a woman will get, what a man will get. When a woman dies intestate, there's a different line of succession. Yes. How does the court today, if we have to go into this, how does the court avoid getting into other issues which are necessarily intrinsically interlinked to what you are arguing? Lord, See, so long as you are dealing with broader issues like dignity, the right to family life, that marriage is an essence of human dignity, that people are not trying to denigrate the institution of marriage, but trying to benefit from the institution of marriage. Why should we be confined only to heterosexual couples? That's conceptually the easier terrain for the court to cross. The difficulty is, once you cross the terrain, there's no stopping then. The court necessarily okay. has to... That's a follow-up question. I think what I would also echo what the Chief Justice is saying. My Lord. The constitutional or the theoretical underpinnings of your, your argument and uh, your predecessors is easily comprehensible and let's say that's uh, I mean one can it's an achievable target as long as we confine ourselves to that but if we were to take adopt, adopt the course that you were asking us to necessarily one one of the important consequences and I'm not highlighting this as the only which is what the chief justice actually alluded to is that the provision makes a distinction between personal laws and personal laws. And then which means that a spouse who is not recognized in personal law, but who is, who is treated as a spouse according to our interpretation, will actually lose out in the event of an unforeseen, unnatural death. Let's say where, you, where, where one of the, spou the spouses have, neither of the spouses have made any testamentary bequest. 
In such a case, when intestacy follows, the surviving spouse is left with nothing, perhaps even the children, because then the personal laws of succession apply at least in the case of four or five communities. According to this very enactment. Yes. My Lord, may I quickly take you to page 35 of my submissions, where we have a series of laws that differently impact same sex and opposite sex couples. And, and, and the reason why I'm showing my lords this, and this is in tandem with an extra one. Page 74 of the submissions to 102, this is an exhaustive list. Now, the reason why I'm showing my lords this is my lord just as but in yes. principle, in principle, my lord, I already have the principal protection of the courts. I have Puttuswami and I have Johar. That's exactly the point. Yes. Oh, yeah. But but my lords, the problem with being protected in principle is that principle is not enough for the business of life. We entirely agree with you. There's no doubt about it, Dr. Guruswami. You're absolutely yes. right. You're spot on. I mean, that's exactly the cause of worry for us also. Death, See, my lord, uh, declaration is the first step. The second step would be some illustrative list like the list we have provided, using workability, which we've also provided. Then the rest will follow, my lords, as it has are always followed. And Dr. Guruswami, just to play the spoiler here, yes, how many times are we to play the follow-up? That is what worries us. My lords. Because if we are not to get into this, just because it suits the certain, certain cases, and that's a thorny issue, Aren't we avoiding it? My lords. Our job is to look at the workability, not only of what you're showing as illustratively. Yes. What you have next, and some of you have originally next, is the correct thing, which is virtually a reenactment of those provisions. Mm -hmm. Forget re, re, reading into or reading up or reading down. We are virtually reenacting, which is, you know, that major, the hard task you're saying, we will leave it later. How many more litigations are we going to face? Of course, you are not, you can't answer that. But we have to answer it or many courts will have to answer it. So well, is this our job? Ultimately, we'll come, come back to the same point. Well, uh, you know, all these statutes which you have referred to, you've given us 35 examples of the statutes. All these statutes, confer social welfare benefits on certain persons, certain categories of persons, right? Uh, upon the wife of a deceased employee, on the husband of a deceased uh, woman employee, so on and so forth, like maternity benefits, provident fund, pension, income tax. So these statutes in that sense are also exclusionary. They define who will get the benefit, right? Now, by accepting your submission, we are going to say that for the purposes of these statutes, these benefits must primarily devolve on the spouse of a same-sex couple, which necessarily means that we are excluding a category of beneficiaries who the statutes otherwise statute otherwise contemplates. My lords, may I respectfully submit, my lords? that i am not asking so for that. essentially what we are doing is in this process by conferring benefits on a particular category of persons the court is necessarily giving a value judgment of who will be excluded from receiving that benefit by inter by interposing somebody who is going to get benefit under that statute my lords may i answer my lords uh, with just taking any example from this table any example my lords but Maybe take any example. Take your Provident Fund Act. Yes, my lords. Or take the Payment of Gratuity Act. Yes, my lords. The Payment of Gratuity Act, my lords, that's the first in, in, my, in, in my table, the Payment of Gratuity Act 1972. If my lords, please just turn to page 30. Simple example. If, a, if an employee dies without having, say a single employee dies, not married at all, forget the same sex, the Gratuity Act will define or the law of succession will define 
who will get who will be entitled to those benefits right yes my lords and it only now by saying that that benefit which is contemplated under the payment of gratuity act should be given to the same sex spouse of that particular employee we necessarily mm -hmm. exclude employees who would be the beneficiaries who would otherwise be entitled to under the act my lords now the only point which we are putting to you is this does this not therefore interview does not does this not raise some some issue of statutory value judgment my lords mm -hmm. may i just say this my lords if if we just look at the term sex these are you know these three. because now that we get into follow my lords so you know the broader canvas puttaswami yeah. johar we've yeah. now come a far long 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 way ahead from there you need not really labor that no my lords question is this is now what is the uh, yes. this is now the worrying uh, may i just like, not the jurisprudence back to the graph jurisprudence on 21 is the, the least my bit lords, of a my lords ground. sir i won't be touching it my lords may i take you my lords back to the gratuity act this is page dr marika gurusani please see that's the reason we began by saying that we will one we are the rule on the view you want to be adopted of a status of a marriage and certain whatever consequential benefits arise point 4 of mr mukul rodgi's argument i bow down my lords beyond that <laughs> when exactly. you get into the nitty gritty and i agree with the chief justice it become very complicated exercise and it include it is a inclusive methodology and exclusive methodology both creating different rights how can all these scenarios or the complete uh, painting if i would say be painted in advance that's a difficult exercise my lord most of the examples that are given in the submissions really involve only a re understanding of the marital relationship that's it because all of them the gratuity act the provident fund act says the benefit goes to the surviving spouse so here the technical leap that needs to be made is not much my lord it is only about who can be married the moment we are read into the sma then these statutory requirements are satisfied because for instance the gratuity access can only nominate his oblique her family members as a nominee and any nomination outside the family is void the explanation says married children these are the nominations so my lords all that we would humbly request there is just a reading in to who can marry the moment we are read into the sma then these problems dissipate and that reading into the sma is a declaration by my lords then in Dr. all Dr. these statutes dr guru swami may i my lord my lord bring to your attention our section 21a which is very specific and it is within the SA, you know sma because if we have to make some uh, provision of reading in under that act we have to make it consistent with the other provisions now section 21a is a departure it was brought in in 1976 to preserve the application of personal laws in the case of these four categories hindus buddhist sikh or jains my lord means that you revert to your personal law then that brings you back there is no there is no question of your shying away from this and like dr singh we fairly argued about section 27 certain i think mr rothgi argued about other provisions the remit of this is very clear that you will revert to personal law and in the case now as you say the business of life has to go on on an every day basis now we as arguendo we declare that man is includes woman or whatever and we say spouse what happens is what could happen is if tomorrow somebody dies due to an unforeseen circumstance like a an accident if it is an accident there is no intestate test there is no testamentary you know disposition and let's say assume there is no will then necessarily revert you will revert to the hindu marriage act hindu succession act and the order of succession will have to be in accordance with that the surviving spouse will be deprived we will have to make sense of this and i am i am drawing this to your attention because even if we accept your argument about section 4 all this will immediately stand up 
we 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 may or not may not go into other statutes but certainly internal sense of this enactment is necessary my lords there will need to necessarily be internal coherence there is no way that i i would be able to argue out of that there is your my lords will have a declaration that, that my respectful submission there would be a declaration there would be some illustrations and most <laughs> civil law would be covered by that declaration there will be situations like 21a and those will follow my lords and that is the intention of the special marriage act my lords that it follows in this way and we will not be exempt from that there is no category of citizens that will not have to necessarily follow how the special marriage act devolves in all its parts it is one law for all my lords you know dr guruswami before the personal law was codified by the hindu code bill in 1956 and then you had various other acts also which were were enacted marriage adoption these were two areas which was and in fact industry as well which were all governed by first by by convention by custom yes and by the uncodified hindu law for that matter yes my lords therefore there was the uncodified hindu personal law the mitakshara yes sir there bab now what the hindu code bills did in 1956 was to bring about a codification of this now the special marriage act was in that sense an exception it carved out an exception because it it professed to be neutral to religion the idea was to to encourage or to at least have a legislative framework for intra religious intra caste inter inter religious inter inter caste marriages so on and so forth so what it did essentially was to carve out an exception from the general principle that marriage interstice adoption all matters which fall now within the ambit of entry 5 of list 3 were governed by your personal law prior to the codification by the uncodified uh, hindu law now what we are therefore you know even the argument i mean i'm this is something which you need to also reflect on we need to reflect on the argument that we confine it only to the special marriage act is therefore this that you create for same sex couples a non religious right am i right a non religious framework for marriage and then whatever follows with it so a there's a value judgment in that that the court will not give this benefit to those people who still say that well i assert myself i assert my right to stay within the fold of my religion this is for those who are governed by the secular law namely the special marriage act second then even the special marriage act in the case of these four communities hindu jains buddhists and sikhs and sikh takes you back the original act is it to state the moment you apply the special marriage act you are ousted from your family the moment there is a severance from your family you lose all the benefits of being a member of the family you cease to be a co-partner in the family this now 21a tells you that when you go back this will not involve a severance from the family yes yes so which indicates therefore that even in respect of a marriage which is governed by the special marriage act all other incidents of the marriage are governed by your own personal law and your personal law is intrinsically religious based whether it is in the case of the hindu subject to the social reform which was brought about which was permissible under article 25 or in the case of muslims or in the case of parsis zoroastrians it has to follow my lords quite right therefore there is I... there is no there is there is no denying or getting over the link between all, even the all, special marriage act and personal all, law not at all my lords there is no you know as as litigators we may be seamstresses of arguments my lords between judgments articles but there is no getting away from this i am not mm-hmm. trying to say that thus far and no further i am not trying to say separate but equal uh, i would never say that 
this will be the natural flow for now we are suggesting interpretive techniques a declaration a broad definition that is what we are suggesting in the converse all that is can't ever be confined only to the special marriage act it my, has to go beyond the special marriage act my 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 substituted submission simple point the income tax officer will say what am i supposed to do in respect of a gift by a spouse to another spouse it will follow my lords it will absolutely follow therefore we also had an hma petition it will absolutely follow oh, i will not shy away from me that what your your message is you say things and brace up for more litigation my lords uh, because we don't believe parliament is going to enact anything my lords no. I, and and i don't believe either as my lord saw on day 1 we don't we, i didn't we, say we no my lords yeah. we don't believe my lords as uh, in yes i am here not, my lords I'm not, not my lords we would no no Sorry. my lords we I cannot not suggest that no, just in the same vein then yes. are we to speak for the entire are you to speak for the entire community of uh, 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 the the people who are before us are you truly representative there may be diversities there are diverse Certainly, my lords we there, there are only are 19 petitions before my lords preserve. there may be unheard voices who may want to preserve their way of life their their traditions i'm not i'm not talking of the general population i'm talking yes. of in your the communities that you represent that they do not want a break from their traditions and the yet the moment, moment we secularize this and go one step further we assimilate this and constitutionalize it as it were my we are lord, we are in denial of their rights my lord respectfully those who wish to participate in this you know new definition of the institution may participate those who do not wish to participate will not participate even today many opposite sex couples opt for a live in relationship even though they have the benefit of marriage but they will not participate not because they don't want to participate but they will not participate for the reason my that they do not want that, to participate at the cost of forsaking their yes my their lord connects with their religious communities right that is also a choice linkages that they is they don't want to break those linkages will apply to opposite couples and hindus in the same manner he is a part of us Yours today, my lords. All our submission on 21A is that we implore this court that the Special Marriage Act, as it is, should apply equally to same-sex and opposite-sex couples. Now, those who choose to opt in, those who choose to opt out, those rights are retained for whatever reason. It may be a matter of faith. It may be a matter of way of life. those choices are actively exercised constantly by same sex and opposite sex couples but the ability to have that choice is an act of constitutional principle and 21a gives all couples that choice opposite sex and hopefully in future same sex 21a recognizes that choice is being exercised by opposite sex couples on a constant basis we don't ask for anything more than that my lords and i bow down my my lord justice but i appreciate the point you're making that within the community as well there may be those who do not want to exercise this choice and that is valid principle under inclusion inclusion under inclusion under inclusion is a legislative device which is open to the legislature and we uphold we yeah. uphold under inclusive classification saying that parliament or the state legislature does not have to legislate on everything to legislate on something that's the principle of under inclusive classifications but that's very different from judicial review <laughs> judicial review is never by its nature under inclusive my lords Ju judicial review is declaratory and applies across the spectrum my lords i to whoever I, falls within the sweep of the declaration respectfully then say no. two things both in alternative one so both in terms dr guruswami both in terms of how we will have to craft such a solution and on more fundamental philosophical grounds based on the on, on jurisprudence on judicial review principles 
there is a lot of thinking to be done in this uh, in this matter. My lords, your lordships have a burden here. There is no question. See all all that we are, what you can make out. My lady, how far and no further. My lords, my lady, the now, no that is something which is really engaging us. For you to say that the SMA be brought in line in such a manner that we should read spouse where it's husband and wife and person where it is a man and woman. So far, so good. But there's something more to it. Certainly. This is a legal and constitutional journey. There is no question, my lady. Like we have thus far made a journey from the days of Suresh Kaushal. Expecting the court to take that step, the one step further, and stop at that. No, my, my lady, our respectful submission is a declaration that expands the definition of marriage, that makes it more inclusive, as has always been the case with the laws of marriage in India, that there has always been an opening up of who can you marry, inter-caste, inter-faith, and what after. My, my lady, then we will have specific provisions that this would be applied to, and then that is part of the journey. And all the rights and benefits of marriage, if a death. She muted, no? Mm. Can't hear, no? Yes. I can't hear her. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, got sorry, uh, Ravi, sorry, Sanjay, we are, we are lost. Uh, we are losing the benefit of having a little uh, chat with you on the on the dais. <laughs> so sorry, sincere apologies. We'll talk later. We'll talk across from the once we have gotten up at four o'clock. So sorry. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> Well, not a phone call. No, no, that's okay. We'll, yes. we'll talk later. Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Guruswami, can we suggest one thing? Yes. Uh, we've placed our uh, perspective on, uh, you know, on, on, on certain issues of the matter which are difficult. We'll break here with your submissions. Maybe you can reflect on it and give us a two or three page note on this. You know, just sort of put your thoughts together and give it. That will really uh, help us. So we'll go on with now. We'll take up uh, uh, Mr. Saurav Kripal yes. and then Ms. Grover because they have a little time to, yes, to reflect. Yes, and then. I'm thank, thank you, Dr. I'm very grateful for your patience. Thanks for your formulation. Yes, Mr. Kripal. No option but to address this elephant in the room, which has been raised on workability, Milad. I think that's correct. But Milad, I say two or three things. First, Milad, Guru Swami alluded about lunch. I was hoping. There is this study in Israel which says that after lunch, judges are more liberal in granting relief because eating food just satisfies them. There's actually a study. I was hoping that will carry on now after lunch. In terms of workability and the issue at hand, the question is how far and how much further do we have to go? This is just any other case at the end of the day. It may mean a lot for all of us personally. It may mean a lot for many other people in the community as well. But at the end of the day, my lords are discussing a list which is before my lords. Someone has challenged the provisions of the SMA and the SMA alone and no other act. My lords will therefore decide the constitutionality and mold the relief accordingly. If somebody comes with a petition of the HMA, ABC thing, the doctrine of precedent has earlier evolved, including this case will then be applied to that case in future and say, well, the necessary implication is that yes, gratuity must also be given to you because we have so held in 
superior or it is not possible because millet that is the difference between parliamentary functioning and judicial decision making parliament has the power and the jurisdiction in one go to have a complete understanding of everything that does not mean that when there is an infraction of fundamental rights and i think millet we must remember that this case is about marriage equality and we focus constantly on the positive aspect of our article 21 article 21 there is a very important article 14 right as well saying that if heterosexual couples have the right to get married under the sma and if you do not exclude that include us non heterosexuals within the domain of the sma there is a violation of article 14 what is the consequence of a normal violation of article 14 or indeed any violation of any article on part 3 article 13 has the answer article 13 says my lords will strike down the act so if my lords holds that non heterosexual couples have a fundamental right to marry article 21 but also have a right not to be discriminated against because the moment the state recognizes a right in the heterosexual community and says you can have it but you cannot the obligation normally is to strike down the act so my lord under article 13 my lord will see article 13 yes of course so let's so what is it that we're asking my lords to do we're asking my lords that normally you would strike down the entire sma because that is the consequence if heterosexual marriage is Can permitted answer this in terms of the previous question also. yes well, so i'm saying some, so what we do under inclusion in article 14 well, the question is whether they will be under inclusion or not in certain circumstances under inclusion is permitted i would say this is one of those cases sex being part of sexuality part of article 15 it is in by virtue of the fact that it's a suspect category of classification they can never be under inclusion on the ground yeah. of sexual orientation that is the argument that has already been already been made there may be cases when my lords can under classify on certain grounds but the idea of sexual orientation being so innate and already having been held in Navte Johar, you cannot say today that we will permit under classification on something as fundamental as a ground mentioned in Article 15. Because why are the grounds mentioned in Article 15 special? One is that they are just a species of the general equality right in Article 14. But unless there is something more than the to the words used in Article 15. Striking down the law doesn't benefit you. Exactly. So unless. Right? So there is a principle of utras magis valiat quam periat. Well, it's, that is why we are asking for reading in or reading up. These are legislative, well, these are interpretative devices to see that, an act from unconstitutionality. That, Normally, Kripa? an act like this would be unconstitutional because it is hit by Article 14 of the Constitution. My Lord would normally have to strike down the act. Now that does not, that amounts to throwing the baby out with the bath water. My lords do not want to do that. Mr. Kripa. That, please, please, please. Am I am I audible or oh, is there yes, a problem? Yes, yes, now, now, yes. I think there's some lag. Yes. So your argument oh, yes. is an extension of what Mr. Rotigi argued. That firstly, you attribute, you attribute an exclusion. No matter whether this was intended or not, today you have to attribute this exclusion. Number one, step one is attribute and exclusion. Step two, the exclusion results in invalidation of the enactment. Yes. Step three, to the extent of the invalidation, it has it, it is rendered void. Now, in, that, in this case, there is no question of it's to the extent. To the ex, there is no question of to the extent of repugnancy being void. It, it has to go. If it then you say step four, in order to save it. This is the way out, read it, read in something. Now, aren't we uh, taking too many legislative steps here? Let's, the greatest well, sorry. Number two, you're yeah. actually bringing in a contemporary intention when the intention was something else at that time and it was enacted. Yes. If I may address the point, that is the first point. The second point is, uh, as a matter of fact, the, show any uh, anal analogous case where an under classification has been invalidated. Over classifications are typically invalidated. 
under classifications of course we have a new matrix now but under classifications usually have been upheld yes sir and then the question of the first the fourth step yes i'm yes please go on please yes Yes, sir. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. No, no. Uh, Justice Bhat was asking, but I was just informing Justice Bhat that yes. the judge was yes. referring. Yes. My lord says that there is a four-step process. Well, it's, I would submit that this is a very classical four-step process. There is nothing unusual in what I am suggesting. Every time the doctrine of weeding down is undertaken, there is a similar process that happens, which is there is a finding of invalidity. to that extent it is or is not or the entire act is void is determined and then a uh, interpretive device is used so as to save something from the vice of unconstitutionality but the problematic part is the first point my lord made justice but about we are attributing that there is an inconsistency well yes because article 15 and 14 analysis requires the examination of the effects doctrine what is the impact any law has on a on the rights of a person is something necessarily which is required to be done when a violation of article 14 or 15 is to be examined and it's very clear in this case that by failing to recognize marriage equality and therefore treating and giving certain rights which follow from the sma and more than anything else the recognition by the state of your, the recognition of your relationship and giving the sanctity of the of the authority of law to that relationship has a devastating effect on the dignity of an individual as well as the substantive rights of the individual so well it's to say that we are attributing an exclusion we don't need to it is it's it's writ large the fact is the operation of the law as it stands today has a disparate disproportionate impact on opposite sex couples or non heterosexual couples directly hit by article 14 so well if that happens i fail to see how we can simultaneously retain a act which gives rights to people who are identically placed like us and but does not give a right to somebody else for instance will i ask myself if parliament were to enact a law that says that people can get married under the sma only if they have certain property in hand and they do not have other property so it's a non property classes the way voting used to be mill at one point of time certain requirements are added and those additional requirements plus a, a section can be framed positively or negatively and i'll take my lot to one judgment in romer and evans in the us supreme court a section can be framed in the form that a and b can get married but if c and d are necessarily excluded the section can also be framed and has the same effect as all persons other than c and d can get married and in fact millers that is the only way to read the special marriage act because the way the special marriage act operates today is any two persons can get married as long as they are heterosexual that is the way the section reads what is the consequence the section is also to be read as inevitably no two persons who are not heterosexual can get married there is a clear discrimination on the ground of sexual orientation in this reading of the section well, that flows logically there is no violence doing to the act the section says any two persons if it is to be read as husband and wife inevitably it means two heterosexual people can get married next consequence two non heterosexual people cannot get married now the question is can the law countenance can the constitution countenance this form of invidious discrimination against non heterosexual persons i would submit and i'll take my law to the uh, lords to the to the test in this because there's a holistic reading of 14 19 21 sometimes there is an over emphasis on 21 but the reason we are also here and we call it i repeat the marriage equality cases that the moment heterosexual people have a right you cannot say well let the let's not the uh, uh, good be the perfect or the uh, enemy of the perfect we can't give you everything so we'll give you nothing Hmm. that will it cannot happen in the march of constitutional law and the march of interpretation of of the constitution and our rights it cannot be said that is an all or nothing approach it may end up being all and i hope it does but it does not mean we do not take the first step and will that is how judicial functioning happens by precedent 
My laws will decide the list at hand, the issue at hand, determine what are the rights at stake, give a finding. If that has an effect or impact on another case, then that will be decided in the other matter. Well, in 1950, the constitution promised equality of sexes. In 1950, are we not still coming to court in 2023 saying that there is sex discrimination? Or are we supposed to say, well, everything was given, we will give one judgment in 1950 that henceforth all rights given to women, uh, men are to be given to women as well. That's not how a decision making process works. That's not how litigation works. We come back on a case to case basis and there's nothing unusual about this. So what we are saying is, if you do not read the word spouse into section four of the S SMA, then the section is bad. My Lord will see section four with me. Different plane. Yes. Sorry, yes, sir. Just, I was asking me to commence resume, but I was. My lords, we'll see section four. Yes. And what is the argument if our declaration is not to be given? The word person will have to be read as a heterosexual person, notwithstanding anything contained in any other law for the time being in force relating to solemnization of marriages, a marriage between any two heterosexual persons, because everyone else is excluded. Heterosexual persons may be solemnized under this act. Can that be countenanced? Because what we are saying is any two persons must include both heterosexual and non-heterosexual persons. And therefore, if you are to restrict by any form of interpretation, the two people getting married under this act to heterosexual people alone, then the act is bad. And well, it's, it's some form of a charging section and every other is a machinery provision. This section is the heart of the act. If our marriage is recognized in section four. Can we say that the intent by section four was to cover same sex couples? No, Milad, of course it wasn't. It wasn't, right? Milad, no question about it because this is 1954 legislation. Of course it wasn't. Yes. Milad, I, I asked myself a question. Then the number of time my lords have struck down or read in matters whenever my lord reads in something in a statute. You don't ever go by what the original intention was. The doctrine of reading in is not some form of grant fi finding the original intention and giving effect to that original intention. The doctrine of reading in forms a very different basis of jurisprudence, which is constitutional to save it from the vice of unconstitutionality. Of course, this was not the intention. But today, the constitution and the today's reading, a statute is governed by the original intention of the parliamentary lawmakers. The constitution is not. We do not have the doctrine of original intent in our constitution. We have always seen that it is a living organism. So today, my laws are interpreting certain articles of the constitution, part three of the constitution, 14, 19, 21. Today's understanding of this constitution renders this section void, if not read in any other way. We are not at all indulging in an interpretive exercise to determine what lawmakers in 1954 thought. We are indulging in an interpretive exercise to ensure that the rights guaranteed and recognized in 2023 by virtue of this act, my Lord's judgment in Supreme, or supposing my Lord decides you have a fundamental right to marry. But there's also a very fundamental principle in law called ubi use ibi remedium. There is no point saying you have a right but no remedy. To have a right implies a corresponding remedy. That, that is the question. Can we say, for instance, can we say, for instance, that the Hindu court bills when they were introduced in 1956 were far reaching, far reaching pieces of legislative and social reform. Correct. For, because the Hindu court bill, you know, recognized by and by, of course, with the amendments, co equal rights for women yes. in succession, in uh, interstice, by recognizing that the widow will have an equal share with the children. But not the right. Which... But now, can we therefore say, can someone else say who does not belong to the Hindu community, that because this right 
of equality is recognized only in the Hindu court bill. Therefore, this law is violative of Article 14 because it does not recognize similar rights in other communities. No. No, as long as you have an underlying basis for that because, right. And the reason I asked you is this, because it's open to the legislature to take up one aspect of a social Please, problem. The correct. problem which you took, uh, took up in 1956 was the lack of equality within the community of Hindus. Absolutely. And created a law providing for equality between men and women to the to the extent it has been adopted in the Hindu court bill. Absolutely right. Therefore, the absence of a broader legislation covering a wider class of persons is not a ground to strike down that legislation. That is true, Millers, provided that there is no underlying right already in the community. <laughs> this is a two-step process. My laws will first have to find that there is a fundamental right to marry, which I say my laws will find. Having recognized that there is a fundamental right to marry, Millers, therefore, this is why we will do a simultaneous or an integrated proportionality test. I'll take my law through that. There's a judgment of my law, the Chief Justice, on integrated proportionality. How do you test the constitutionality of, a, of an act? When simultaneously three articles, the Golden Triangle, 14, 19, 21, en enacted. But coming back to my law, the Chief Justice's point, it is not open for a member who does not be belong to a community and say that they have that right, give it to me as well, unless there is a prior exercise by my lords to say, the horse, Ali Unde, the fact that they have the right of uh, of X, you too have that right. Now, my lords, are, today we are first saying that recognize a fundamental right of non-heterosexual people to marry. Once you recognize that right, if we can convince my lord that there is such a right, that right has a consequence. One is X number have been given a right. Some other people are being wrongfully denied that right unconstitutionally. So. Hence, use this interpretive exercise and grant us that predetermined, pre existing, and pre found right. So, well, this is not a question of locus of some person who does not have something and a negative argument of Article 14. My Lord has always held that there can be no negative Article 14. This is not a case of me saying, give me this right because someone else has it and that is alone. I'm not making that argument. I'm saying you have to read each of these constitutional rights together. I am saying that I have a fundamental right to live with a person of my choice, a right that is recognized in Putiswami and Johar. Having found that I have a right of that nature, you cannot A, leave me remedyless, but you need not leave me remedyless because here is another group of people who have that same right. You simply have to read, do some interpretive exercise to include and give me the same rights. So my Lord Chief Justice's question would be different. Mr. Kirpal. Finding a way to give that right to another set of people within the statutory framework as an SMA, then the aim and object of SMA at that time was, the very premise was, yes. irrespective of faith. Correct. The whole thing is based on there being no faith. Absolutely. In any particular religion and therefore opting for this. Yes. So but Even caste disabilities also. Both endogamy and exogamy were intended to be excluded. So both say same yeah. gutra marriage or intercaste marriage okay. are permitted by virtue of the SMA. That's important right. because this came in before the Hindu court bill. Yes, right. that, 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 that's true. That's true. It is right. So keeping that in mind, and then <clears throat> what we think would be argued from the other side, would the court be doing violence to the aim and object of the statute? Of course. Well, reading that, into or reading up as you... That's, that's, and that is my point. We are not asking for my lady to do an interpretive exercise to give meaning to the original intention of the statute, which is what normally a, a court does in interpreting a statute. Normally you would say, well, you, that is why you look at parliamentary debates in a statute, because you are bound by what the parliament originally intended. That's right. That is always the case. A statute is always interpreted by the intention of its original framers. But in it's certain a, instances... For example, there's one example you may consider. It's, it's not direct, but again, taking off from your argument that equality existed right from inception. But for the longest time, females were denied a large section of property amongst Hindus, Correct. right? Till 2005, when it was universalized. Of course, some states, three or four states in the South and Maharashtra, they granted these co-partionary rights to females. And yet we had no qualms enforcing those disabilities, nor even excluding, uh, you know, uh, un unmarried people from certain rights towards their father's properties. Correct. Why? 
that too is an elephant in the question in the in the room today the why is the court somewhere these institutions have come up it's not created by law they have grown up from society so those social institutions were recognized and even as the chief justice said and very aptly these were these were custom this were blessed by custom enforced by court and found to be compatible with the constitution therefore at one go what you are trying to say is you may be i mean getting the right may not be a problem but the nitty gritty of it and you rightly started with that yes sir i am suggesting the right, nitty- getting the right may be a not such a insurmountable issue mm. getting to the other part making it workable these Because- all the not one many a herd of elephants in the room which you will have to address yes sir so coming back to this question well is the nitty gritty versus the recognition of the right so well first thing i say is there is a constitutional obligation on this court having found a right you cannot say that because of legislative draftsman draftsmanship your right is effaced because that will necessarily be the argument that the legislature has created so many hurdles in the free exercise of a fundamental right that your fundamental right itself ceases to have meaning because it cannot cannot be enforced by court because that is the argument of the other side that look you may have a right to marry but we can't give it to you because we have drafted our laws in a way that your right to exercise that is impossible that is what so what they what the argument would then be that the constitution normally by virtue of article 13 would trump a statute but if you tr- frame a statute sufficiently complicatedly you can trump a fundamental right because that is the argument effectively because what is the consequence of the argument of the other side that because it's unworkable therefore do not give them a fundamental right that is the inevitable argument for us and i dare say that there is no greater constitutional anathema than that argument because tomorrow they will frame all kinds of laws parliament whichever parliament may come and say we'll start defeating your fundamental rights because we'll make them unworkable a workability argument will us is no part of an article 13 analysis my lord will simply say is there a constitutional right and has that right been violated and if it has been violated there is an all or nothing approach either strike it down or uphold it by reading up reading in or any other interpretive exercise but to say you you have a right but because it is unworkable we will do nothing about that right allow that injustice after having found the right and suppose the parliament does not intervene i give the example of nepal because the tactic there was also tried millets in sunil pant a decision comes six years ago by the yeah. supreme court of nepal that we direct you to frame laws in accordance with the constitution and find a, a, a right nothing happens so are we then going to live in a lawless society is that the argument from the other side that we we expect you to live in a lawless society that the supreme court of india having found a constitutional right which inheres in you sorry there's nothing we can do about it we leave you to the mercy of parliament which may or may not act and has shown in the last 75 years in terms of lgbt rights that it will not act well so that is a complete anathema to the rule of law but also to the constitutional scheme it cannot be argued this this argument cannot be countenanced mr grubal uh, thank you we'll call upon uh, mr linda grover now anything sir we want to supplement let's just one thing you. i wanted to uh, give actually on uh, the issue of the composite test yes and i'll just give amlet i don't think i need to do very much i i, I want ms grover to have her time sure let's there's a what i have done is given a copy of uh, the relevant extracts of judgments in my note i have not actually uh, given my submissions but my lord has a supplementary note i believe it is yes it's here yes yes in the compilation and well it's just one or two paragraphs i will i'll, I'll show from that because well while we do this analysis constitutional analysis of 14 19 21 and this of course i'm beseeching as one composite test the effect of the violation of any one fundamental right has a different consequence in law in terms of the relief my lords will give so article 21 will give a positive relief and article 14 typically will give a negative relief of striking down but in certain instances if that yields 
a constitutional chaos, my laws will also read it up, is what I'm going to argue, what I've argued. That's the effect of Article 14 analysis. My laws will just see uh, uh, this Akshay Patel, the proportionality analysis, Milads, and I'll just three of, just paragraph 27, the be uh, beginning. Adopting proportionality analysis not only provided a formal structure through abstract rights litigation can be analyzed, but it is also, when applied properly, has the potential to improve the quality of judicial reasoning while protecting individual rights, as noted in Aadhaar. My laws will leave this, come to paragraph uh, 30, where it, where it, paragraph 30, where it says, uh, this is when used, uh, I'll just, in Puttaswamy, turning the page, on the top of the page, hence the court can adopt, top of page 2, Miller, of my note, hence the court can adopt integrated proportionality analysis where the limitation on each of the rights is common and affects them in a similar way. So Miller, I would admit, submit that in the present case, that is very clear. Both my right to expression under 191A, my right to uh, equality under 14 and 15, and 21 dignity rights are affected in the same way. Namely, I'm not allowed to get married. And Miller, so there is a four-pronged test which is given in paragraph 31, Romans 1, 2, 3, and 4, is the measure in furtherance of a legitimate aim I would submit Milad, the only legitimate aim is a legitimate purpose that I think has been addressed simultaneously uh, uh, substantially. The only legitimate purpose that can be pleaded in the counter and two have been pleaded. One is the importance of marriage as a social institution, which is a legitimate purpose. But the second purpose which has been given, which is that it is contrary to the will of the majority, is not a legitimate state purpose because it is contrary to Johar. Constitutional morality is the only legitimate purpose. So, that's point. Uh, so there is some legitimate purpose. So clause one is satisfied. Two, is the measure suitable for achieving such an aim? Namely, is prohibition of non-heterosexual marriage suitable for achieving the aim of strengthening marriage? But that was the question that my Lord will have to pose. I would submit the answer is no. Because how is it suitable? If you want to strengthen something, you add to it. You don't detract from it. Let's, I'm just going to speed through. Point three, is the me measure necessary for achieving the aim? Answer, clearly not. You do not, you, is it necessary, is excluding hetero, non-heterosexuals from the idea of marriage necessary to strengthen the idea of marriage? Answer, no. What you have to do is ban divorce. Let's, we talk of personal law. After all, Hindu law recognizes that marriage is a sacrament, insoluble, indissoluble. Yet, divorce is permitted. So if you really want to strengthen the act of, uh, of the institution of marriage, then you have to stop divorce. More importantly, Millards, if non-heterosexuals are excluded from getting married, what happens typically in our society? Lavender marriages. It is very common for a gay man to marry a, a woman or a lesbian to be trapped in an unhappy relationship with a man, two lives are ruined. Is that how we are strengthening the institution of marriage? Because that would be permitted as per the union's argument. As long as you are of the opposite biological sex, you can get married and that will somehow promote the idea of marriage. And I would say there's nothing more detrimental to the idea of marriage than a gay man marrying and cheating maybe a woman. Who, whose sexuality is not revealed to, to, it's rather surreptitious. Point four, is the measure adequately balanced with the right of the individual? Well, this is really a question of proportionality and balancing analysis. It's rather Kantian in its idea as to the effect it has on one person. That was a reminder of that trolley problem we all studied in, uh, in, in university, saying that it may be that one person's right is sufficient to trump the entire community's rights. And here, please analyze the impact on me for not being able to get married, Vis-a-vis -vis what? How is the right of any heterosexual person to get married getting affected by my getting married? That, I, I'll just leave. And the, I had my note, has it? I'll say nothing more. With the economic impact of failing to recognize marriage, has it? there's one study which shows, and it's there in my note, on, on page 10 of my note, it's almost 1.7% of the GDP of this country is affected by failing to recognize LGBT relationships and giving equality to, to LGBT relationships. There is a lower uh, lessening of productivity. And most importantly, Millers, in the matter that I'm, I'm appearing in, a large number of people, at least five of these petitioners, plus more, have indulged in what is called the gay brain drain. If you do not allow marriage in this country and people want to get married, have children, have other rights, the best minds, I'm not saying Millers, non-heterosexuals uh, are the best minds, but they're not bad minds either. Millers, if they all leave this country, to secure freedom outside this country, I do not see how public interest is furthered. That will tell you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Kupar. Kupar. Kupar.
Thank you. Please, my lords. My lords, I will, I represent. Yes. My lords, I represent petitioners who are a little different from the nature of petitioners who have been heard till now. Some, uh, uh, Mr. Ramachandran and Mr. Vishwanathans were perhaps of similar uh, context and background. Uh, my petitioners can be broadly classified into two groups. Petitioner one to petitioner four are queer feminists and trans activists. They have for the last few decades been part of providing shelter, emergency helpline, etc. And they form what is called the National Network of Lesbian, Bisexual, Intersex Women and Trans Persons. Petitioners number five to ten who have been anonymized even in this petition because of the precarity of their lives. They are couples in three couples in relationships involving a trans person and a cis heterosexual woman. And therefore, my lords, I would urge that while for shorthand we are using the term same sex marriage, perhaps as uh, was said by Mr. Kripal, these are marriage equality petitions before my lords. And I would say address that my particular petition is about marriage and relational equality. And I will come to that a little later. My lords, why, why this need for marriage? Much has been said uh, about this. If I would just speak about uh, drawing upon the experiences and the lived realities of these petitioners. On 1st April 23, a panel hearing, a close to a panel hearing was held in this uh, city by PUCL and the National Network where 21 persons of different sexual orientation and gender identity deposed. Centering, uh, the focus was on familial violence on persons of sexual, different uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. Why I need to focus on this is that there seems to be an assumption that the families will necessarily be supportive. They are fortunate and it's good that some are but many may not be. And these come from very marginalized contexts in terms of class, caste, religion, and the primary source of violence, hostility, interference, is the natal family. And therefore, uh, why does marriage become such an important legal shield, a legal protection, which goes to the heart of Article 21 also? My Lord, just two, I will point to two uh, excerpts. My report of that public panel hearing is in volume five Actually, of compilation you, uh, two. Grover, can you sort of summarize your points so that you know we can take the take your uh, submissions down and. Uh, My lords, I actually have put them in. Just, just uh, formulate the three or four key points so that we can take them down and. Bullet. I will. I will just do that. I've actually also put them in a four-page note so that. My, you, you've submitted a supplementary note, right? Yes, a supplementary note, just this afternoon for ease of another one Besides for convenience of the court as to what is it that I will be addressing. Short submission. Uh, Please, my lords. Yes, yes. Short submission. This afternoon, my lords. 14 page. Page, we have got it. Yes, this is a shorter, uh, the 14 page one. The 14 page one. Uh, 14 page. Please, yeah. my lords, it's the same. Where yes. the uh, prayers. The prayers and the distinct issues. I'm not taking my lords through the issues that are already covered. We have it. With... We have this. Please, my lords, I'm grateful. My lords, the, the distinct issues and my specific prayers relate to one is a declaratory relief vis a vis the. Brother uh, Call, do you have this? Uh, the... It was a page. Yes, okay. I have it. The 14 page, no? Yes, 14 page. Grateful, my lords. Justice call also. Quarter past one. Justice Bhatt also. Isme dala hai? Nahi na? Okay. 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 Problem. Isme hai? Ye hai? Oh, acha. Yes, yes. Please, my lords. My lords, my prayers are... Para 11. My prayers are in the last page 13, para 11, which would encapsulate what my main submissions would be. One would be a declaratory relief vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Special Marriage Act to save it from unconstitutionality, and many arguments to that have been addressed. Uh, the second, and 
on the notice. So A and B have been fairly... Please, I'm, I'm not going into that at all, yeah. my lords. Uh, on the notice, domicile... What happened is that the index mm. is not working. Yes, please. My lords, the Chief Justice has it? Yes. Please, my lords. Uh, my yeah. lords, on the notice domicile objection regime, again, I'm not going into it, although I am saying that it is not only for, uh, we are seeking a striking down of sections 5 to section 10. I am mm -hmm. relying upon, I may not have a chance to address on that, but the intersectionality and the, <laughs> particularly the patterns of marginalization and discrimination that these persons find themselves and there is already judicial evidence to the effect of how persons who are from particularly marginalized groups continue to approach the court even to get married under the Special Marriage Act. I will then come, my lords, to page <coughs> two of my... Is, is anybody before this court for seeking the relief at D? Your I, I beg your pardon, my... Prayer at D. D. Prayer D. Please, my lords. Is anybody Please, for us? Seeking this relief specifically? I am not sure. Because the way it's been worded, we haven't come across. Uh, I, do, I don't think so. I don't think so. That's why uh, right. I would be grateful. It is a distinct issue. Right. Your ladyship is right. It is a distinct issue. Uh, but I would today be emphasizing on E and F. Those My written submissions deal with D. Today I will emphasize on E and F, which are again instead of D. D. Mm -hmm. My uh, today's E. I see. Um, and, and is now actually represented by Mira Bhavar. Please, please. Thank you. My Lord, my specific prayers, before I come to that, I only want to draw the attention of this court to Section 3 of the Transgender Act. Uh, the transgender uh, issue was dealt with by Ms. Kothari. In Section 3 of the Transgender Act is mandates person to NALSA, a prohibition against discrimination against all per transgender persons, and actually then specifies in terms of health, employment, rental accommodation, educational institution, etc. Well, the argument, and if this is read with Section 20, which says that this law is in addition to, the argument that I am submitting here is that the Transgender Act necessitates that the Special Marriage Act provides recognition to marriage between trans persons and whoever is the other partner in which the marriage is taking place. Because without that, there would be an inconsistency in the reading of Section 3 and the Special Marriage Act. And perhaps the harmonious reading would require to read both in order to ensure that the rights guaranteed by Section 3 don't remain illusory, as well as to provide consistency between the two, Section 3 actually necessitates the recognition of marriage under the Special Marriage Act. My Lord, the next aspect, I will not go into indirect discrimination, intersectionality, all that is taken from the judgments of this court and is before the court. I will go immediately to what is a distinct aspect. One, we are saying that given the nature of natal violence, and this natal violence is severe, if I can just read this, if I can just take my lords to volume five, compilation two, PDF page one to five. <laughs> Volume 5, Compilation 2, my lords. It, there, it has only one document. Actually, that is the in report of that hearing where 31 persons testified and stated what was the nature of violence they had faced from the natal families coming from small then towns and rural areas. Detailed report. Volume 5. Yeah. Volume, uh, compilation 2, my lords, Volume 5. 
turning into 227 pages. I'm grateful. Family violence in life. Please, my lord. Years. Which part are you? On? I'm on page one to four, uh, PDF page one to five. Internal page would be 124, PDF page 124, 125. It's titled Ongoing Negotiations. Please, Your Leadership. Hair and clothes are markers of identity, gender expression, and one of the first markers of identifying somebody as belonging, who, who may determine their gender identity differently. In fact, the act of cutting the hair or keeping the hair long invites consequences which can range from house arrest, no schooling, post marriage at 14, these are all testimonies before my lords, as well as corrective rape. I am reading only one uh, testimony here. Every time I go home, I need to cut my hair, dress differently, misgender myself, and it is an intensely difficult experience. I cannot express in words how intense it can be, even though it does not look like what I'm experiencing is violence, or it is not as intense, it is there when I have to keep pretending with them. There is this insistence that I need to survive, for which I need education, so I have to keep doing it. My Lords, the, question, the reason why I'm drawing my Lord's attention to this is, what is that unit? to which persons who are facing the ire, mm -hmm. violence, and interference from the family, from the natal family. Where do they go? What social formations do they make? One is under the Special Marriage Act, if we succeed in persuading this court, to allow them to be married, and that marriage provides the legal protection and the legal shield, which the natal family did not. That would, if my lords would now come to my prayer, E, which may be distinct and different from the other prayers that are before this court. Page 11. Page 13, my lords would see prayer. I'm sorry, Ms. Grover, this whole, there's a lot of confusion in the nature of volumes. I'm so sorry, my lords. There's one volume four by Vrinda Grover and Shivam Singh. Then there is another volume five. There is another volume four. Lord, the report was only in volume five, and I only wanted to read one excerpt. I will not be referring to volume five again. Now, volume five. That is only the uh, report, my lords. See the, uh, with, with all due respect to the council who have been coordinating, these these volumes and additional volumes need to be numbered or you know in some way there has to be a rational you know rechristening. It is difficult to manage, and as we go along, it'll be worse. Yes, my lord. It's a bit overnight. I'm still not able to locate this. There are two or three volume fours and volume fives. Feel corrected, my lords. I apologize. My lords, we have also been giving them last minute, so I, it's not fair to put the blame on her. All right. <laughs> yes, all right. My lords, what are the, what are the uh, points? The crux that I'm, I'm referring to, my lords, we are saying that one is, as has been said by others, to provide recognition through a declaratory relief under the Special Marriage Act and the striking down of sections 5 to section 10 of SMA. My lords, the other prayer that we are seeking is that. As my lords knows, both family and marriage, there are based on experiences and analysis. There can be a feminist jurisprudence and a feminist critique of the of family. There is a critique of the family that it may perpetuate caste purity and patriarchal control. So there are persons who may. Yes, please go on. I'm just waiting for the Chief Justice. Yes, yes. Uh, my Lords, there are persons who are of different sexual orientation mm -hmm. and gender identity who, because of the hostility of natal family, actually have intimacies which are non-conjugal in nature. 
which may not have, which may be non-marital, they are non-procreative desires, but they are intimacies. And that is the only support, the only social enclave of comfort, care, help that they find. My Lord, for instance, during COVID, a study that was done on trans persons found that when trans persons due to lockdown and the nature of the, the disease had to return to their uh, natal families and their homes. Over there, they faced violence, they faced for prohibited conversion therapy, and that was actually uh, an illustration of what would happen if other social formations of care and support did not exist. This is what my Lords has described as atypical family. This form of chosen family is recognized in our law. My Lords, for instance, adoption. Adoption is a form of chosen family. Today, we recognize families and we conceptualize family as by blood, marriage, or adoption. But that is a form of chosen family. My Lords have also, if my Lords would just see, I have listed here the Mental Health Care Act. My Lords would just have section 51C of the Mental Health Care Act. There is increasing legislative and judicial recognition of persons who may not necessarily be conjoined through marriage or uh, conjugal intimacies. My Lords, yes. uh, I'm referring to Section 51C of the Mental Health Act. Read with Section 14. In relation to advanced directive, every person who is not a minor shall have a right to make an advanced directive in writing, specifying any or if all of the following. C, the individual or individuals in order of precedence he wants to appoint as his nominated representatives as provided under section 14. Section 14 talks about appointment and revocation of nominated representative. And my lords would see that what is the what the legislative intent here is that here is a vulnerable person who may not get necessarily the support and whose personal autonomy may, may not be respected by natal family members or persons by blood or marriage. And therefore, the, the, in such a circumstance, the legislature is giving primacy over and above blood and marriage to a nominated representative. My Lords, in my particular case, petitioner number one, Ritu Parnabora, is a queer person and she has, both her parents have passed away. Her father was supportive. She's now left with a family that does not understand, respect or support her sexual orientation. She also has a debilitating disease. She needs persons who will care for her. She needs persons who will take decisions on her behalf. She needs persons who will understand what her in, is in her best interest. If she is left to the mercy of the natal family because there is an assumption that they would hold my best interest at heart because of my sexual orientation, gender identity, the natal family may not be the primary carer for me. Therefore, in such circumstances, intimacies are formed, which may be conjugal in nature, which may not be conjugal in nature, but these are chosen families. My Lord's has para 26 was read earlier, I will not repeat it, about atypical families. My Lord's, one more example, when one looks at international law, the Yogyakarta principles were uh, read out. I would like to read another part of Yogyakarta principles, principle 24, part B, which actually talks of diverse forms of marriage and says uh, families not formed by marriage or descent. And therefore, this recognition and acknowledgement that there is a, uh, what my Lords has described as an atypical family, and which can also be referred to as a chosen family, that chosen family need not be by blood, marriage, or adoption. My Lords, would, I'll just read out the relevant part of uh, Principle 24. Ensure that laws and policies recognize the diversity of family forms, including those not defined by descent or marriage, to and take all necessary legislative, administrative, and other measures to ensure that no family 
it's put in the record. They may be subjected to discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity of any of its members, including with regard to family related social welfare and other public benefits, etc. So in the imagination today, both in terms of marriage and in terms of family, my lords, I, I would say that what we are canvassing before this court is a different imagination, a new imagination of marriage and of relationships and of family R imagination which actually places at the foundation love care respect which may or may not come from the natal family because of my sexual orientation and gender identity and there is data and evidence to that effect my lords would then say judicial recognition has been given to hijra gharanas which are well established social formations in south asia in terms of legal heirs to succession of property, high courts have recognized members of the Hijra Gharana. My lords, why do I need this, this chosen family, apart from the description of violence that I've uh, placed before the court? What do rules and laws require? I have to visit a person who I actually share an intimacy with in jail. Petitioner number seven before my lords today actually is facing a case of theft and abduction imposed by parents of petitioner number eight. It's common practice. Who will come forward when a person of this sexual orientation has been falsely implicated? Who will come forward to visit me in jail, stand for bail, etc.? Bail, OK, there, is, there can be a wider consideration if you have control over the person. Again, to take rights to be performed at the time of death or how I am. There have been very traumatic uh, um, testimonies, how misgendering takes place at the time of death, how I am dressed for my last passage. All these who would respect, not the family that abandoned me and that inflicted the violence on me. For all those reasons, the chosen family, even beyond non-conjugal intimacies, today is seeking recognition. Because without that, they have no support structures through which they can live. I will just end, my Lord, because I know I am almost out of time. Hmm? One prayer refers specifically to nomination, that I may be allowed to nominate as next of kin a person of the chosen family. My last submission, my lords, would be that where, as has already been said by Mr. Ramachandran, that what is the protocol to be adopted? There is one protocol available in Shakti Vaini, but as it fell from my lords, the Chief Justice, that these protocols should not trample upon the agency of the persons concerned to whom protection is being given. And therefore, I would urge that in nature of Garima Gre for trans persons, similarly, safe houses, shelter homes, where the NGOs and the queer persons themselves are involved in running those spaces, which is already happening under the ministry, as well as reiterate Arnesh Kumar specifically for these persons, because they stand at a greater risk. I have, all, and there is an order, if I may refer to, of the Madras High Court the S. Sushma order, which is a continuing mandamus in which multiple such directions have been passed. There is a glossary that is available, my lords, at um, in volume five, PDF number 205 of, and 216. Mm -hmm. This glossary has been prepared by members of the community themselves and therefore may be of some assistance in how they, they are to be uh, referred to and what is the preferred way of addressing thank you so much uh, please please my lords now uh, we've we've heard 11 counsel on this side uh, we had planned to complete all submissions today at the most we can give about say 45 minutes tomorrow morning for everybody else to wrap up so i would think that uh, we can give uh, 10 minutes to uh, uh, miss karuna nandi 10 minutes to arundhati kaju uh, then uh, we would request all of you to ration time. Uh, Jadi Gupta is for the interveners. Mr. Tulsi Raj is for the interveners. Then you have, after Arundhati, you have Amritananda Chakravarti, Raga Babasti, Shivam Singh, and Manushinar. 
or we'll start tomorrow morning at 11 sharp because we take about 20 minutes for the uh, for the mentioning and then five minutes to regroup. Yes, my lord. Uh, I'll also talk to Justice Call and Justice Bhatt. Both of them are uh, still recovering. Perhaps they can. I'll have a word with them. What whatever is convenient and medically advised. Uh, but tomorrow, by uh, Mr. Solicitor, uh, by 11. We'll stick to our time. 45. We will request to do yes. We'll stick to the. And time. I will request everybody else to just give us a page of bullet points. Just a page of bullet points so that you know if you can put it together and that will just make it easier for us to know what the formulation is because now we've seen the whole gamut of material if you just get your uh, formulations on one page in bullet points i think that will be good enough brother but uh, brother call uh, both of you do you think that's all right if they give us just on a page the for formulations on bullet points yes yes he does so that that will yes, just sir. make it uh, precise and uh sharpened you know so we'll pair this down further my so yes, we before we break the meeting. Sorry, uh, uh, Brother Bhai. Can I put one question? You could just answer it by a note even. Ms. Grover. Please, my lords. Uh, Please, my lords. And, and there, this is very interesting, this recognition of the Hijra Please. Gharanas. Please, my lords. Do they, is there any documented material about forms of marriage between transsexual persons? Please, my lords. There is. I, I will place that on record. I will place that on record. I'm grateful. Thank you very much, Mr. Please, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, brothers. Thank you. Thank you.